are going to be a band. It's going to be like a band, an intro band. Well, good morning. I'd like to thank you for joining us on this beautiful morning in Cleveland, Ohio. Having grown up uh, about 30 miles south of here, I can answer all of your questions about Cleveland. You may ask, uh, where did the sun go? Um, well, the answer is, we don't know. And in fact, uh, it's probably somewhere, uh, wherever it goes, between the months of uh, October and April. So. Uh, my name is Nicholas Garfolo. I'll be your moderator today for this panel discussion in propulsion education. We've seen this great shift uh, in curriculum of engineering and propulsion engineering, not only in the curriculum itself, but uh, the tools and engineers, uh, the tools that engineers, researchers, and scientists use. Consider the engineering skills that were necessary to develop the technology uh, for the lunar missions, for the dawn of the jet age, uh, to today's modern high bi bypass uh, propulsion systems, to the shuttle program. Uh, one of my, I would say, experienced colleagues uh, talks about punch cards. That's a far cry from today's uh, computing, uh, desktop computer or your, your, la uh, your, your cell phone, right? So this leads us to our key question uh, this uh, morning. Are we succeeding in preparing the next generation of propulsion engineers? Is education, engineering education fundal fundamentally missing something? Is there something that we have taken for granted or lost? As we travel down, down this high-tech path uh, for better, faster scientific tools, is there something we lost in that shuffle? Have we lost that kinetic learning component, a less hands-on approach? Are we losing that experience of breaking things, uh, the experience of failing? I'd like to pose a corollary question. Does our current educational experience alone fundamentally prepare us for the work environment? We are joined by five panelists today. Ms. Lisa Tague of the Royals, Royce uh, Corporation, Dr. Dimitri Mavris, the Georgia Institute of Technology, Dr. Mike Benzenkine of the Ohio State University, Dr. Jose Camberos of the Air Force Research Laboratory, and Dr. Paul Orquist of the University of Cincinnati. Ms. Tague is um, the head re of uh, research and technology of the Rolls Royce Corporation in Indy. After obtaining a bachelor's of master's in science degrees from North Carolina State University, Lisa Tague joined uh, Detroit Diesel Allison, now Rolls Royce, in Indy in 1983. She's held a variety of technical and managerial positions in engineering, starting with career in structural analysis and then moving into design engineering and development of the AE family of turbofan, turboprop, and turboshaft engines. From there, she moved to the T56 engine program, becoming the chief design engineer. Her next role was director of the product reliability, responsible for resolving product quality concerns in customer re return material and providing technical support for engine production in Indianapolis. Lisa then spent two years on assignment in the UK as manager, uh, intern staff co coordinator, working in the Rolls-Royce Research and Technology Group in Derby. Upon a return, from the UK, Lisa became chief project engineer for the Joint Strike Fighter Lift Fan, leading engineering activities in Indianapolis for the joint program led by Rolls-Royce in UK. In her current role as head research technology Indy, she is responsible for the planning, execution, and global coordination of research and technology activities in Indianapolis, developing gas turbine technologies for future products. The engineering employee development group also resides in her organization. 
joining together a coordination of university research activities with employee development and STEM support. The intellectual property group of Rolls-Royce in the US is also part of our organization, thus bringing closer together creation and protection of company electional property. Dr. Dimitri Mavris is the Boeing Chair Professor of Advanced Aerospace Systems Analysis, Director of Aerospace Systems Design Laboratory. Dr. Marvis earned his Bachelor of Science in 84, his Master of Science degree in 85, and a doctoral degree in 88 in aerospace engineering from Georgia Tech. He's the Boeing Chaired Professor of the Advanced Aerospace Systems Analysis in Georgia Tech School of Aerospace Engineering and Director of its Aerospace Systems Design Laboratory. He has co-authored with his students in excess of 500 journal and conference papers. Professor Marvis is recognized internationally as a leading figure in the field of multidisciplinary analysis, optimization, and design, probabilistic design methods, physics-based analysis, and design of unconventional vehicles, systems of systems, and architecture-based systems engineering, data, and visual analyses. Professor Marvis is the AIAA Fellow, member of ICAC Executive Committee, and AIAA Institute Development Committee the United States Air Force Scientific Advisory Board, and the director of AIAA Technical Aircraft and Atmospheric Systems Group. Thank you. Dr. Mike Benzekine is currently the director of the Power and Propulsion Center, which is created in 2010. He is also responsible uh, in the College of Engineering for collaboration activities in aerospace, aviation, and flight activities. The PPC encompasses comprehensive multidisciplinary activities focused on research, technology, development, and the education related to aerospace power generation, wind turbines, energy needs, and the environment. The PPC is responsible for the creation of the two test facilities in the gas turbine laboratory, which should be operational in 2014. Under Dr. Benzakai's leadership, industrial partners have been strengthened with GE Aviation, GE Energy, and GE Research and Development Center, and the NASA Glenn Research Center. The new partnerships have been created with the Warsaw Technical University, the Institute of Aviation in Warsaw, University of Stuttgart, University of South Carolina, and Beijing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. These partnerships have promoted the exchange of students at the undergraduate and graduate levels, and has helped set Ohio State University as a premier national and international academic center of excellence for research and education in proportion. Dr. Jose Camberos, is a university relations manager for the Air Force Research Laboratory. He holds an adjunct position at, at uh, AFIT, the Air Force Institute of Technology, and the University of Dayton. He has been a part-time instructor since 1993. Dr. Guberos has his bachelor's in mechanical engineering and material science from UC Berkeley and graduate degrees from Stanford University. Dr. Guberos is recognized for his exceptional and sustained contributions in the multidisciplinary methods of aerospace vehicle systems, integrations, designs, and analysis. Dr. Paul Orquist is a Bradley Jones professor and head of Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics in the College of Engineering and Applied Science at the University of Cincinnati. Professor Orquist is also co-director of the UC Chongqing University Joint Cooperative Education Institute, which is a four plus one program for Chinese students with five semesters of cooperative education experiences in China. Professor Orquist received his BA in mathematics from Darwin, Dowling College in Oakdale, New York in 1983, his MS and PhD in aerospace engineering in 87 and 90 respectively from North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Upon gradu graduation, Paul joined the faculty of UC. He has extensive experience working with the gas turbine industry via sabbaticals, consulting arrangements, and membership in the GE Aviation University Strategic Alliance, as well as long-term co collaborative relations with the US Air Force Research Laboratory. His research interests include application of CFD simulations for supersonic mixed compressor, compression inlets, com combustor turbine hot streaks, cooling hole interactions, turbine purge cavities, compressor near stall performance, weapons bay cavities, vortex asymmetry about cones, flow control devices, and aeroacoustics. As you can see, we have a healthy mix of academia, government, and industry. I'm gonna give our panelists um, ask the panelists to provide a, some opening statements. We'll follow that up with a roundtable discussion with questions from myself, the panelists, and the audience. I ask that you please use the microphone um, to ask your questions, and we'll wrap up with some closing station, uh, questions and statements. Ms. T. Okay. Thank you. So hi, I'm Lisa Tag. Um, I'm glad to be here today. Everybody hear me and everything? Okay. 
Um, I would like to talk to you a little bit about, um, uh, I don't have any specific recommendations for, for my colleagues in academia, but I would like to talk about how we approach um, the pipeline strategy, um, how, we, how we work with universities and other educational institutions uh, to help us uh, get the uh, workforce of the future, and then have a few closing uh, remarks about, uh, and observations about that. There we go. Um, to start off, here are some things we look at as attributes of an effective employee. And yes, technical skills is, is right up there at the top. And, and we look to uh, employees to come to us from universities with a, a, that basic uh, technical skill background. But a lot of the other one, uh, a lot of the other uh, attributes like teamwork and breadth are all, all about how do you work together with us in this very complex environment in which we, we uh, design and produce gas turbine engines. It is, as um, Al Rumek just told us at the other session, it is, it is complex. What we do is, is complex, and it does require working a lot with people. It requires delivery according to schedules. It, do, it requires understanding the breadth of what we do, but maybe focusing in on your particular area. And teamwork is, is very vital in terms of, of how, we, uh, how we work together and, um, and get things done. Uh, so we can make our products of the future. So in terms of, of um, developing employees, we do take a pipeline approach, and we're not unique. Um, we, we know that uh, the other industry members do the same type of thing. The first column there, it, it, we look at this as a progression. The first column is what we, is just a snapshot of what we do in K through 12 STEM support. Um, the middle column would be re engagement in the, the collegiate career of, of students, and then the yellow column is when they join us uh, as, um, as employees. For example, the, the first column there, Project Lead the Way, great program, engineering-based curriculum taught in high schools and, and lower now. They're headquartered actually in Indianapolis, so we're very pleased with the partnership that we have with them. First Robotics is a great program, great hands-on. Um, we participate in sponsorships, mentorships. Our employees get a lot out of it as well. Uh, and on down into the Lego League at the younger ages and also Vex Robotics. Um, so that type of hands-on thing for, uh, for uh, school kids is a great opportunity for our employees to reach out um, and as well as give the kids an opportunity to see what it's like to do something with their hands and, and think about things in a different way. We do operate a high school internship program. We've actually had interns become co-ops, then become employees. And uh, so there are select schools that, that they come to us under a high school internship program. Um, and it's a good way just to give them a flavor of what it's like to really work and show up to work on time and, and uh, have to deliver something. Um, so we're, we're proud of that. The Girls Power Camp, that's a, a preparing outstanding women for engineering uh, roles. It's a program that we do with our local Indianapolis uh, University, IUPUI. It's a combined campus of Indiana University and Purdue. We uh, provide speakers, other uh, opportunities, tour type opportunities for that. That's for high school girls. Pathway to Engineering and Science Bound, those are two programs that we work with Indianapolis public school systems. Uh, Science Bound is a very nice program where Purdue is teamed up with Indianapolis Public Schools and also various industry in the area to identify kids in middle school that then can go on this program and then um, uh, uh, take advantage of the access to engineers, see what, what engineering programs are really like. If they, if they complete the course of study, then they get to go to uh, Purdue tuition free. It's a really, really nice program. So then when they, when they go off into college, um, there are several ways in which we interact with students to get them to know what it's really like um, uh, because we think that the more students can understand how industry works, the better off they are at choosing that right, right fit opportunity for them. We do have a strong co-op program as well as summer internships programs. Co-op doesn't work for everybody based on school schedules. Uh, internships is also a very strong way for us to uh, offer opportunities for students to come in and look, look see us and, and vice versa. Uh, research assistant, us doing research at the universities 
either with senior design projects or funded research. Um, Professor Mavris here, um, we, we have a very strong relationship. I hope he'll say it's strong. I, should, I don't know. I, I, uh, from our standpoint, we get great graduates that way. Um, we, we fund research there. And more importantly, uh, by, by bringing the, the students into us, we can embed that learning that, that Dimitri is so successful at getting in his students. We can embed that learning in, in, our, uh, in our company, which really works out well. We do other things. You know, we sit on advisory councils with different universities. Um, and we reach out to other student organizations, student organizations including SWE, NSBSHIP, uh, ASME, AIAA at, at, those, at those universities. So we try and, and reach out to universities in various different ways. Uh, then the yellow boxes there um, are when we think about bringing students in. Um, if, they're, if they've been a cooperant intern, they can convert into, into full-time employment with us if, if the fit is right. We do direct hire as well. And then we also have a graduate development program where it's a competitive program to get into. Um, and if you're on the program, you get additional opportunities to um, have leadership experiences or broadening experiences that we hope will help with that broadening while learning how to focus on some depth of technical knowledge. And then, of course, what we all desire is for them to become the leaders and, and the great uh, employees of the future. In terms of looking at our university partners, we, we tend to look at, uh, at the successful partnerships as like a three-legged stool. We really like it when there's an alignment between research uh, recruiting and also learning opportunities for, for our employees. Um, and we think there's a lot of synergy there when, when we can operate to a university's strengths and recognize that and we can get return on uh, uh, research results as, as well as uh, employees who uh, understand that particular area of research. And then uh, learning programs, uh, we, we have a very, um, Purdue is of course just up the road from us and that's probably our strongest one for learning opportunities for our employees. And they come down and teach a Master of Science and Technology on our, on our campus. So that's a very successful uh, way in which we uh, can make sure that third leg of that stool is, is there and available to our employees. Uh, I have to say something about the Rolls-Royce University Technology Center model, or UTC. Um, Rolls-Royce does have a very robust network of universities supporting us in research, um, and we call it UTCs, or University Technology Centers. Uh, Rolls-Royce started that in the 80s uh, when um, the research activities were a bit more scattered and and it tended to be the professor you knew, the one that you went to school with, or whatever. And Rolls-Royce said there's a better way. We want to focus. We want to have a critical mass at universities. And we're going to choose certain universities to be our, our university experts in those particular technical areas. So you'll find um, uh, in, in the UK, it started off as a network involving universities like Oxford, Cambridge, Manchester, um, Southampton Imperial College, great universities. And as Rolls-Royce has become more global, um, they've uh, made the, the network more global as well. So now it is, is more worldwide. Um, but these are some of the things that, that we, um, we look to as, as positives about the relationship because we appreciate the, the specialized skills and the different perspective that universities can bring to us because we, all, we don't want to always get an industry mindset. We look at the, at the industries of, uh, we want to bring the university aspect or perspective to help us with, with uh, our industry. And then we can offer a route to market for university ideas as well as career opportunities for people who eventually might want to leave academia and come to work. So we think that that's a, a really good partnership um, where, it's, where it's most successful is when we can attract some external funding and other people see what we're trying to do. And then it's a win-win-win for uh, the capability that the university has been able to build. Rolls-Royce can take advantage of it. Other people can take advantage of it. And it's a real good synergy uh, of, of activity there. 
Um, as I mentioned, uh, UTCs are worldwide. We have about 30 of them uh, globally around the world. Um, there are five in Germany, uh, Kottbus, Darmstadter, a couple of those. Um, we, do we have three in the U.S. We have uh, Purdue, which is the first one, uh, high mock propulsion, and more recently in, in advanced compressor research. Just earlier this year, we celebrated Virginia Tech and University of Virginia joining our UTC family, uh, Virginia Tech in advanced systems diagnostics and UVA in uh, advanced material systems and coatings. We also have very strong links with Illinois and Georgia Tech. They kind of, kind of round out our top five partnership universities as, as well as we do have some strong links with MIT as well. So in summary, um, I just wanted to say I, I think propulsion remains exciting. I mean, I, uh, the research that I see in my job is just so exciting, whether it's new methods, whether it's new materials, material systems, the whole systems integration approach, um, the, the new architectures that we're working on for the next generation. Uh, it's really exciting, um, and, and I have been very pleased to have this as my career choice, and I hope other people will continue to see it as as that. Um, I think that industry does benefit from our partnerships with universities. Um, we, we like to give uh, students an opportunity to see what it's really like and we hope that it, by doing so then we can find those, those good fits. We do bring in some really, really outstanding graduates to come join us. We would like to keep that up and part of the way we do that I think is with our partnerships with universities. Um, Industry also does, I believe, benefit from a strong pipeline approach. We want to be involved. We want to help inspire the next generation um, because we, we believe, like hopefully everybody else in this room, that it's important to get the next generation inspired, identified, get them excited about it, get the STEM interest going, and we do what we can with mentoring, sponsoring, working with educational institutions at, at all ages of, of students' lives. And our employees are very excited about it as well. They, they go out and do things. They sponsor Lego League teams. They, they help uh, mentor FIRST Robotics. Uh, they go out and do hands-on demonstrations at schools. Our employees are really great advocates um, for, for all that type of thing. And, and our employees sit on um, uh, advisory boards. They, um, uh, counsel and, and provide guidance for uh, student design competitions and things like that. And in, in terms of the experiential learning, we do think that students really do benefit from the experiential learning. And the more we can do with that, work with universities to give them those opportunities, the better off I think we all are um, at providing the students that. Um, and the last bullet, I wanted to spend a little bit more time talking about, in terms of what we, we need, students can't learn everything about how to do what we do. We, we work, work in a very complex environment, but they need to come to us with basic skills and ready to learn the intricacies of what we do. And with the development program that, that we, that we um, operate, I do see an opportunity to uh, have exposure to the younger ones coming in. And there's usually a moment a couple of years in where it's like, aha, what we do is hard. <laughs> it's complex. You know, they, it's like, wow, this is, this is fun, this is exciting, but it's complex. And, and every, I've seen several of them go through that aha moment. Um, and so we need them to realize that it's challenging, it's fun. Uh, they can't know everything when they come to work for us. So get the grounding, get the foundation in whatever their technical specialty is, and then we'll, we'll, we can help with the rest, and, and that aha moment will, will come. And, and one story um, that, I, that I do like to tell all the, the um, young engineers that I have conversations with, um, one day uh, during one of my tenures on, on an engine program, we were having a detailed design review and a couple of test pilots were in that day having other meetings and they asked if they could sit in on our design review. And we said, sure. And it was a very detailed one. It was one where we talked about flange thicknesses and how many bolts and the bolt torques and the thickness of the shims and all of those little details about how you put a joint together successfully. And um, at, the, at the end of the review, uh, one of the pilots said, 
thank you for letting us uh, sit in on your session. We really had no idea that's the level of detail that you guys go into, but we sure are glad you do. Mm -hmm. And that story to me sums it all up. Um, until you're there, until you're working, and, and until you are open to understanding the, what we do and it's so important that we get all the details right, that's what we look to universities to do, to send us the employees who will have, be able to get there, have their aha moment, and understand and appreciate the fun and exciting uh, job that we do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your perspective on um, really developing that, that um, employee pipeline and stimulating and highlighting the, the need to stimulate the creative minds early on, you know, when they're in high school or even before in elementary school, and how that, um, all that partnership with, with the, those early educations in the, in, the, um, in the university setting really helps develop your employee base before they even set foot in your, in your, in your, uh, in your offices. Good morning, everyone. I have uh, prepared some observations from my vantage point. Um, I just completed my 34th year at Georgia Tech. So I have actually seen the transition from 1980 to today and all the evolution that the university has gone over. And I can tell you that certain things don't change. <laughs> and then there are a few things that do change. I, I couldn't agree more uh, with Lisa that uh, our product is really developing people. Uh, you cannot really teach them everything that they need to know. You, you, you can possibly even fathom on how you're going to do that. In fact, today, more knowledge is generated in a day than everything that was known in the 1800s, okay? So it's very difficult to keep up. Uh, by the time you put it down, sometimes it's stale. So you have to have this perpetuity of growing and learning and, and, and working and so forth. The other thing is if you look at most of the industries, they, they have a lot of intellectual property. They want to protect this. So they're not going to be putting a lot of the family secrets out there in the open, right? So, so that's the kind of stuff that the student needs to be prepared, that they will pick it up once they start working in those uh, domains. So the best that we can do for them is give them a very fundamental education. And, and I'm going to try to delineate between undergraduate and graduate because they are fundamental differences. And if you look at most of the changes that have happened, it's fundamentally on how the undergraduate programs are, are actually run. You also have to, to remember and know that um, uh, the undergraduate programs are overprescribed. Um, they're overregulated. They cannot increase the number of hours. Uh, probably uh, the first degree should have been the master's degree nowadays compared to the bachelor's, but no university dares to say that because if you say that my program is five years, all the students will run to the university next door, to the state next door, and so forth. So just to go with the theme over here, I decided to collect some data as to what is going on. I remember going to a high school um, program for my daughter and I heard that the bubble is coming and, and that meant that um, we're going to be graduating the highest number of high school students ever. Now it's interesting because when you hear panelists usually say about the, the, the um, lack of engineers uh, coming into, uh, into the workforce and so forth and, and the truth of the matter is that is really a myth. There are a lot of people that apply to the universities. The problem is that the university can only take so many. So they're the chalk point. They're regulated by the state. They're reg if they're a state university, they're regulated by standards and, uh, and ratios of acceptances to rejections and so forth. That's why you see a proliferation of secondary schools to actually absorb a lot of people that do want to go to engineering. In fact, most of the universities are capped in their admissions. So the trick of the game right now is that they don't want people to go to the university as freshmen and sophomores because chances are they might not even make it past freshmen in most of the good universities. So they prefer for them to stay locally, wherever they are. The congressmen really like that, right, because they, the people stay in their districts and so forth. So then if you have, let's say, 20,000 students, you have predominantly 20,000 juniors and seniors rather than freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And if you look at the statistics, when you have dropouts, they usually happen in the first year. That's why when uh, entities come to us and say, I want to fund some students, we try to tell them not to fund freshmen because we don't even know if this freshman will be around in, in two semesters' time. Now, mind you that all those are very good students coming in. 
It's just that the system, you know, kind of flashes them out because either there's too much freedom or they didn't expect that or the grades were in overinflated. But I'll tell you, and I had this discussion with many people who graduated from Georgia Tech, that today they don't believe that they would have been accepted to Georgia Tech. Okay, so the, the bar keeps on rising all the time, but I'm not sure that the product that's coming in is really that much better, okay? All right, so anyway, the, the statistics that I found over here was that we had about 3.3 million graduates from high school in 2009, and at that same time, about 147,000 engineering degrees were awarded. Now, there is a lag of four years, but the statistics were for that specific year. But that kind of gives you a perspective of what kind of numbers we're talking about. Since the task over here is to talk about propulsion and energy, usually you will find these people coming out of mechanical and aerospace departments. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to compare our numbers to what the rest of the world is doing because, again, there is a lot of propaganda out there, okay? So, so this comes from legitimate sources. There were some NSF reports that came out and so forth. But in this specific statistic over here, it kind of shows that we're second to China and Japan is just, just behind us in the number of engineers graduating, okay? Of course, China is uh, 1.2, 1.3 billion. China, uh, Japan is um, 150, 160 million, we're about 320. On top of that, now if we go into this 147,000, we start seeing that there are about uh, 23,000 mechanical engineers that graduated at that given point in time. And of course, the aerospace departments are even smaller, more specialized, and 4.4 thousand graduated from uh, both uh, undergraduate and, and, and graduate degrees. Now, the other thing about mechanical, obviously, not all of them go to propulsion and energy, right? It's a, it's a profession that covers um, the waterfall, okay? So there's all kinds of things that they could be studying. And then if you look at the trends, they are a little cyclical. You can see some oscillations going on. So we're again at the up, and if you follow the previous two trends, it seems that's gonna crash again, <laughs> if you are predicting and you're doing time forecasting over here. But nevertheless, the numbers that I'm quoting over here are actually pretty stable for the last few years. So we have record number of people actually applying and, and, and coming to the university. So in 2013, that's the latest numbers that I have, the School of Aerospace at Georgia Tech had 878 undergraduate students and 496 graduate students in, in aerospace. So in a sense, it's graduating about 6% of the total U.S. undergraduates and about 10% uh, of all the graduates um, in the United States. So with that as a backdrop right now, we bring them in, okay? And uh, by the way, university professors have no power over getting your child into into school, okay? We have absolute power in grad school, no power in undergraduate, okay? And there are people who work in mysterious ways that they make these decisions and they take the heat when people call their congressmen and say, why is it my beautiful son and daughter did not get into the university? In fact, out of spite, the Board of Regents of the state now gave our Archie rivals Georgia an engineering program because there were, there were so many people complaining that they couldn't get into Georgia Tech. So that kind of dilutes the part of money that goes into the university and on and on and on. So that has upset people. But every good university, in my opinion, in my experience, has a very good selection of courses that someone could take. So it's not like those things don't exist, okay? The, and in the graduate program, you have an equivalent type of setting. And I listed some, here some specific uh, courses that we teach our students wh where they're coming in. What we find over here is that the, there's some skill sets that they're lacking as we're bringing in the undergraduates into, into the graduate program. And in fact, uh, I do most of the recruiting for, for our program. And we get about 800 and some applicants every year. And of those 800 applicants, maybe half of them are US citizens, so you tend to prefer those now. Especially as we're moving towards integration, you want to actually have people that they will actually be able to work with the companies and the government. And then we have par partnerships with industries in Europe, so we can actually accommodate the Europeans, partnerships in Asia, so we can accommodate the um, Asian students. But when we look at the skill set, they all come with very good <coughs> grades, highly motivated, highly regarded, I interviewed myself personally to find out if they're gonna be workable and can work in teams. And when they come in, the very first thing you realize that there is a fundamental lack of understanding of the physics, okay? They all took classes, 
but somehow it was like a librarian degree, okay? I, I know where to go find it, I know the language, I know the words, I heard them somewhere, but there is no deep understanding of what that means. And I think at the, at the master's level is the first opportunity um, that you have for doing so. Now, in the animation, the A now has another layer behind it called ME and electrical engineering and ISYE and so forth. And all of those departments offer something that can actually contribute to that system that we call an aerospace system. The problem is that the undergraduate level, the students are overprescribed. They have 120 to 130 semester hours to take. Uh, in many cases, since the state subsidizes, they don't want that number to go one credit more. As people are fighting to put something new in the content, they don't know what to take out. So in the end, you have a very superficial coverage of material, okay? Just the basics and a little bit more, some capstone designs and so forth. Since there are no electives or freedom for electives, they are electives, but they don't have hours to take electives, they actually do not venture outside their own school to go to other schools to take the courses that they want. And the reward system is set up in such a fashion that the units make their money based on how many credits a student takes in their own unit. So if you start, if you're an aerospace student and you're taking classes in mechanical, now part of your tuition goes to the mechanical engineering department. So there is no reward in the process of wanting your students to venture out. Most universities have certificate programs and so forth but the number of electives are, are kind of limited. So the new bullet that came up now says that, uh, you know, although these electives are there, they, they do not take them. And, and in many cases, new technologies, let's say the more electric manufacturing processes and so forth, are not things that traditionally are taught in an aerospace school. So you have to send them off, form partnerships with other schools. And again, the reward system in amongst professors is not set up to kind of, you know, give the money to someone else. So in our opinion, we find out that um, we have now fine-tuned the undergraduate program. We give them the certificates. We give them all these opportunities. We encourage them to do co-ops and internships because Lisa's point is very good. They have to go over there and rotate. And at the same time, it's good for them to mature. There are certain things that industry will teach them that I, as an educator, cannot teach them, OK? Get up in the morning at 8 o'clock and put a tie on and, and so forth, okay? These are not things that they, they, they feel that at the university it's a casual atmosphere. They see the guy next to them. They don't feel the need to, to actually dress up. So it's, it's good to, to do all of the above. And then as the animation is continuing, you find out that if you were to create a degree right now that actually matches the, the demands that are needed to be put on, on the candidate, you need a horizontal degree, not a vertical degree, not a stovepipe degree, but a horizontal degree. Now, that kind of a change is gonna be very, very difficult to happen in the, in the, in the um, undergraduate level. So what we're gonna be advocating here is that we fine tune this one and get them ready, and the ones who want to grad school, that's probably what it needs to happen because at the graduate level, that the story changes. Instead of the parents paying or the student getting loans, now they need a sponsor, okay? So usually the faculty now becomes their sponsor. So in my case, I will go to Lisa, I will go to Mike when he was at GE and so forth and ask for help. You know, uh, we have all these students that are coming in. How are we gonna pay them? Do you have meaningful work to keep them enticed and so forth? And the other thing that is problematic here is that you're making commitments to students in February for them to show up in August and your budgets might not be finalized until January, okay? So, so you're constantly out of sequence. So <laughs> it's almost like a gamble, right? You go out, you find the good people, you bring them in and you hope that somehow the money will appear, okay? Mm -hmm. And because it is a gamble, after a certain point, people get tenure, they, they don't wanna go fight this tough battle on a constant basis. And, and have sleepless nights, okay? So that's why, again, you see programs not really growing all that much and, and staying within the confine of a few students working on a very specific uh, project. Then I started listing out, you know, emerging challenges, okay? Beyond having these fundamentals, what other things are coming along? And, and the aerospace system's becoming progressively more and more complex. 
they have more um, requirements and constraints imposed, societal, environmental, financial, operational. These are stuff that an aerospace department is not teaching either. You gotta bring in the economics and the management, there is a school of policy, and, and all these electives and social sciences and humanities that no one wants to take because no one tells them why they should take them are all of a sudden important. So you have to go back and revisit them. You have advanced concepts. So now everything that we teach them in the capstone design is historical data, you know, conceptual design of manipulation of historical data. And all of a sudden you realize that none of that really worked for an advanced configuration. So you have to go now to the physics of the problem and bring in the disciplines and the high fidelity tools that they have and so forth. Very difficult to do that at the undergraduate level. So usually you see that happening at the gradual level where the emphasis shifts into physics-based uh, design. Uh, when you look at programs now, you have either schools that do aircraft design or they do propulsion design, but they need to do both, okay? So it's very rare that you see those two things coming together. There, there are exceptions to everything that I say. I'm just talking in general, you know, if you, if you cut across all the programs. Most of the formulations that you see are deterministic in nature. So by the time you go to these new configurations, there is a lot of uncertainty that gets infused. So probabilistic methods need to, to, to be brought in. Here is the problem. The majority of the people that come to grad school have never taken statistics and probability. Why? Because it's an elective, okay? And electives are to be avoided if that adds another semester to, to graduation, right? I don't wanna overextend myself. So again, how are they gonna be able to do those things if they don't have any background? You will all be fuzzy stuff to them or scary stuff, right? Then we have this multidisciplinary aspect. Now, so now we're not asking them to learn one thing, we're asking them to learn multiple things and get good at it, okay? And speak the language. Because every time you pick up another discipline is like learning another language, okay? So now you have to be able to communicate with these people. You don't have to be as good as they are, but you should be able to communicate. A lot of the opportunities for advancement are in the fringes of disciplines, not in the disciplines themselves. It's how those disciplines are coming together. And then, of course, if you have this environment, now you start talking about optimization. Optimization has to be taught. But there are the concepts, robustness, where there is uncertainty. There are emerging concepts like resilience. You have time-dependent phenomena. All those things are actually picked up later on. And then you have this emerging field of data analytics and visual analytics, you know, when you have big data, a lot of information coming in, and how to actually handle them. So within our group, um, when the students are coming in, we're trying to give them this perspective of, of the integrator, the system engineer, the system architect. And this is a, a rather special breed of people, okay? It starts with recruiting. You ask a person, what do you see yourself do? And there are some people that they're so unconvertible, you should even try. And if you look at specific domains, the space guys are the hardest to convert to anything but space. Then the control guys are the second hardest to convert to anything but controls. But then the rest of them are actually a little bit more, more easy to, to expose to other opportunities. So when you have people coming in and say, my number one goal is to become an astronaut, and you know that they're not gonna be an astronaut, you gotta give them the bad news that they have to learn something else to provide for themselves. So you got to show them what other things that are there and somehow find a way of exciting them so they can actually believe that this is exciting and they can do it. And by the way, because not everybody can go to one domain, we have to diversify them. And that's the reason why we have all of the various companies and government institutions to provide problems so that you don't send 100 people into one topic. You send two or three people per topic so you can actually cover the waterfront. So as they're coming in, oops, I did, okay. As, as they're coming in, they have to pick up the, um, the fundamentals and then, um, and then learn about design and so forth. So the first here is dedicated to vehicles. And the vehicle is not just an aircraft now, it could be a general aviation, a subsonic, supersonic, hypersonic, missile, or a spacecraft or a rotocraft. So they get a choice of what to select. And as they move into the second year, it moves into the system of systems, you know, like that system in the presence of everything else around it. And because we want them to actually own a problem, and because we have realized that they're very good at solving closed form problems, but not open-ended problems, we have advocated the, um, a concept called the grand challenges. And I will explain in a second what these grand challenges are as a, as a, as a way of proceeding. Actually, let me go to the text, and then I'll show you what those things are. 
The, um, the grand challenges are open-ended, relevant, and realistic research problems. So usually an entity, usually a company comes in and says, I have some seedling money here to, to tackle something over here. It's not usually the, the thing that I do on any, on any given day. I'm seeking for new ideas. So they pay for a student, but then as this group of students are coming in and they go through their program, they become the people who actually perform this little investigation. The problem is not very well defined because very rarely the person who's writing it can actually uh, well define it because they don't quite understand the boundaries of the problem, and that's why it's open-ended. So they have a few days, a few weeks to actually learn the language, find out what has been accomplished in this domain up to now. And I'm a strong believer that everything has been attempted at, at one point. So it's a matter of going and finding out what it is and why they abandoned it, and maybe find the 80% solution and then add to it. And then they own the problem, okay? They have to uh, demonstrate some deep understanding that they understand the problem, and they know what are the issues, so they know what problem they are solving. And then over a nine month period, they have to go execute it. So all the courses now in the graduate program are feeding into giving them the necessary background in actually doing that task. So the task in these examples, one was a, a hybrid electric, the other one with Siemens was on supply chain. They have vendors all around the world and they're trying to figure out how to parse out the engine and who builds what and the like. You have um, more electric aircraft, and John Ayres that came in was, was involved in that through an AIAA program committee that, that we're running, and so forth. So there are usually about 15 of them. People volunteer on the topic uh, that they like, and if it's unbalanced, then I don't leave until they, they get convinced that they, um, they like a given topic. So it starts um, at 3 o'clock, and it goes at midnight until everybody's convinced. So to wrap it up as some final observations, you know, most universities have courses that teach the fundamental skills needed to, uh, to practice propulsion and engineering in general. And although these courses exist, in many cases they reside in departments outside the home unit. And students tend to not take courses from other school units for a variety of reasons, one being the number of hours, the other one is that the university itself is not promoting that, that freedom at, at that level in many cases. Furthermore, the cap on this uh, number of hours uh, pretty much has forced a lot of the courses to be more like uh, the very fundamental early on or to some extent, you know, a survey of, of what is happening. The other thing is, you know, if you think of the undergraduate program as four years program, I hope you realize that actually two of the four years are in things unrelated to the area that you're studying, right? It's the fundamental things in math and physics and humanities and social sciences. That's why they want to outsource that and people come in to pick up junior and, and, and senior. So actually the undergraduate degree and the graduate degree are almost at the same level in terms of, um, of credits and, 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 and gestation in a program. Uh, another observation that I mentioned to you was that uh, as we're moving towards uh, new domains where there is a lot of uncertainty, we cannot be dealing this, with these problems without somehow assessing uncertainty and risk. And the fundamental language behind it is statistics and probability. And quite frankly, I would say that the majority of the people graduating today from most engineering programs have fundamental lack of understanding. And by the way, the ones who have taken those courses, they are so sterile. All the examples are full of math without any practical applications. If, if the teacher becomes a little bit more fancy, he might talk about roulette tables and dice and things like that, which would you know, help him you know, go to Vegas and make some money. But uh, it's not particularly helping us in what we're trying to do over here. The capstone design, again, uh, you know, it would be nice to, to see both the um, propulsion and the aircraft coming together. Even uh, the AAA competitions are either that or that. You know. And in the aircraft design, the proportion is given to them and so forth. It would be nice to, to, to mix that up at some point. Now we have emerging fields, electrical, fuel cells, and so forth. These are different departments, chemical engineering, electrical engineering, and so forth. And by the way, those departments are not necessarily seeing aerospace as their number one customer, right? So we have to reach out there and bring them in into the aerospace context. Uh, uh, context. So in, in a great extent, this horizontal degree doesn't really uh, exist. Um, 
um, and the graduate program is probably where we're going to see some of those changes happen. And the a final thought over here is that when you look at most of those students, you know, they do like this deep understanding. And I think the master's program, if there's one thing or two things that can do for them is bring to their attention that they're not as good as they think they are. And they think they're very good, by the way. So the graduates are like sophomores. And I don't know if you know what the word sophomore means. It's two Greek words put together. That means wise and a fool together, okay? <laughs> so there must be some, um, some reason for that description, okay? So you're trying to calibrate them and tell them that you, maybe you need to go back and relearn some of those things because you never really learned it. You heard the words. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it will be nice to finally work in teams. Undergraduates always uh, have this complaint that um, because there's still quite a bit of variability at the undergraduate level, sometimes they get stuck with people who are unmotivated and they have to carry them. So they get this perception that they have to do everything by themselves. So now that they're at a level of equals, you're trying to you know, recalibrate them a little bit that this is a very important thing. And of course, the last thing is in the end, you want them to develop fundamental problem solving skills, the ability to work with others, define their problem and create this uh, formulation of open-ended problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Marvis. <laughs> Mavis, sorry. I think you really highlight the need for this uh, graduate ec education experience. Often, um, a lot of uh, our graduates tend to go directly uh, into industry and not get that, um, that, um, that education that you need for from a, from a graduate perspective. Now, having said that, okay, the majority of the jobs for most entities are at the bachelor's level. And they might not necessarily need additional skills above that. But if you're gonna be in a high-tech research organization, you have to have a deeper understanding of what you're doing. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Binskai. Good morning. I always learn something from Dimitri. I never knew what sophomore meant, and now I know. <laughs> <clears throat> I think Dimitri outlined very well the challenges at the university level. And just to spend one minute, my background has been primarily industry, 30 plus years in the industry, but by now I have 10 years at the university, so I can't claim, but I don't know anything about it. Uh, it's, if I learn something is that we are here, to, we are the university to develop students into a career that will go, for most of them, to the industry. And therefore, we need to understand that the industrial complex is really the ultimate customer. Now, there are some challenges that come up from the time that I went to school, which is, I like to say, 200 years ago. Um, um, we need to understand how to work this thing. Thank you, I guess uh, I can see the chart from here. Um, I want to talk about two things. One, which are the changes needed because the world has changed in terms of technical know-how. And then I want to talk about process changes because indeed the world has changed in terms of social interaction between uh, the industry, the universities, and so on. Uh, Dimitri has outlined very well the problem on the technical know-how. We need to, the students need to know so many new things, so many f things that did not exist when we started school many years ago. It's in many, many different fields. And propulsion has a great thing, which is what's so exciting about propulsion. It encompasses so many uh, sub-branches, so many knowledge we need to know in lots of fields. It's not easy to change, because it's very easy to add, but it's very difficult to subtract, and that's what um, Dr. Mavris mentioned a few minutes ago. We had the experience a few years ago at Ohio State where we changed from the quarter system to the semester system. So some of us said, this is terrific. We're going to look at the whole program and we're going to be able to reinvent what it needs for the future. Baloney, you cannot take stuff out. I mean, you, you, let me put it this You're limited to the number of hours, whether it's 120 to 29 or 128, whatever it is. If you were to add any hours, that really gives us a problem. What am I doing wrong? 
It sounds horrible. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the mic, it's me. But anyhow, but anyhow does it sound better? But honestly, um, we had trouble really remodeling program from, from scratch. There are many things that have to be taught, which are really the fundamentals. And you need to be very choosy about what you can add. I think a saving grace in my mind, I was really listening to Dr. Mavris, is probably to say, okay, where do I teach hybrid propulsion in details? I cannot even, I shouldn't even try to touch it at the undergraduate level. I should really probably put it at a graduate level. The things that I know, know in technical or how, I just took a couple of examples because I thought they were important. I'm going to go through that, and then I'm going to talk about process changes, which I think, is, in my mind, are extremely important. Because when we have students coming out of the university, they don't go sit in front of a computer like I did 30 years ago. They are interacting with so many people in so many different places, and they need to be trained to do that. So I'll talk about that. I, I think this is pretty important. I'm, I'm just going to talk about the technical know-how. Uh, Basically, we can make a long list. I would say it's really material sciences in much more knowledge of material sciences than I did when I started. I understand some details, composites of one, multidisciplinary analysis, I think that the Mavis referred to it, and I just took another example, additive manufacturing. The design engineer who's looking at putting together a two machine together needs to know some of these things, but I don't think he needed to know, or he or she needed to know 30 or 40 years ago. Um, I just, I'm gonna flip for some charts. This is just an example, okay? It's an engine, it's a high bypass engine, no matter what you want. I looked, I, it, I pulled it out of the presentation, okay? I said, this is Gen Y, the engine for the future, let's say 2000, 15, 2020. This is a chart I didn't make for this. I looked at it, look at this. There are 10 technologies around that little sketch here. 10 technologies which are needed to make the new product. We can see them here. I'm not gonna go for all of them. But look at the stars. It says there are two new technologies needed for a new engine product. Five of them have a star. Five of them are connected with basically uh, materials, materials technology. From a composite fan blade uh, in the front, which right now most of us are going into a different type of fan blade, whether it's composite or otherwise, a lot of them driving towards composite fan, and with it goes a whole technology on how to analyze composites that we sure did not know. I had the pleasure, this pleasure, developing an advanced fan on composites. We didn't know anything when we started. We didn't know how to build it. We didn't know how to analyze it. We definitely didn't know how to inspect it and so on. These are intrinsic knowledges that we didn't go through at all in school. I don't know what I listed here. Uh, hybrid ceramic bearings, you know, another one. Uh, going around ceramic matrix composites. Very popular in some, in some, in some institutions today. Again, really materials. Uh, I don't have to go for high temperature rotor materials, it's always was an issue, an issue uh, challenges. And then now more and more nanos getting into structures in different parts of the engines. So I do think having a required course, I say course, I'd like to say courses, but it's course, on materials is probably should be part of a basic propulsion uh, curriculum, it might take another specialized course on composites, on how to analyze composites. Okay, this is just an example, and I'm going to skip some charts because I have too many of them. Well, this is just just some pictures I took. Obviously, the temperature is getting, the engines are getting hotter and hotter, and not only on the compressor size, but on the turbine size, and here again, it materials are coming in knowledge of what materials can do, cannot do, what it takes to develop materials. Uh, 
and this is not only on the hot section, but really on every part of the engines, new materials are coming, are coming in. Um, I was at Farnborough a couple of weeks ago, and Pratt or Alcoa was advertising a blade in um, basically aluminum, an aluminum blade. Okay, it's a different world. We tried to do it a few years ago. We couldn't do it. It might be because of the speeds we were running. We can do it. So I'm saying it's an open field. It's an open field in terms of capabilities. And I think the students should be reappraised of what it means. We're all going for titanium alloys, tie aluminoids, for instance. Right now, most of new engines have tie aluminoids on the back end of low pressure, low pressure turbines. We didn't know anything about it when we started. We didn't know anything about it when we were working on it. It took us a while to get there. And I don't have to go for single crystals. All the message I want to give is I do think materials. I think, Mitri, if I had to make some choices, I put this still at the undergraduate level. Um, uh, I have a few more examples. They all have to do with materials. I'm going to skip it. Um, ceramic matrix composites. There's a, uh, Christian Maria and I are talking about combustors, liners, and how we coat them. I mean, when we worked on that picture, which is by now over 15 years ago, that was really an advanced product. It's going to be there in most engines in the next few years. The same thing goes for the other guys next door, which are really CMC veins and blades. Okay. So anyhow, enough talk about materials. The other thing is how to and manuf advanced manufacturing, how to make parts. We learned something, if I can say something positive about my years of General Electric, we used to have the design engineers and the manufacturing guys. And they never, the two of them didn't talk very much. And it was, it was a really challenge. This went away a few years ago. We said we're not going to let design engineers do design parts that cannot be manufactured. And this is when you have design for Six Sigma and it's a whole uh, a technology I don't want to get into. But it's very important to know more for a design engineer what or he what he or she can count on when he designs a part. The whole world of additive manufacturing is at its it's still in very much at its infancy stage, but they need to be appraised of what it is and what it can do. Because uh, you can join metals, you can develop metals, uh, but gets away from the old welding engineering part and use some of the new techniques. This is important to know when you design a new jet engine. If not, you will do the same thing that you have done before. And while this is, is okay for most parts, but it's not okay if you want to program. Because the challenges are here in terms of more performance, lower cost, you know the litany. I don't have to go through it. And I think it's important for the students to be appraised of that. I just went, I went back, okay. Okay, so this, and I picked up two subjects, which is manufacturing and materials. Uh, it's, this is my opinion, uh, and it, it needed, I don't, before I leave this, maybe I'll go back to this anyhow, but the capstones. Capstones that Dr. Mavris referred to, very important, were in terms of having students in their last year use their skills on a definite program. It has many, many, many things. I went to school in a different part of the world. Uh, I went to school in, in Switzerland. And the last year, what we had to do, we had a project. It lasted, it was what we called a diploma bite. And it used to take six months. And to me, it was really, if I can call it a mini PhD. And, and what it did, it forced us to really have a problem, analyze its boundary condition, and develop it. And, and, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot, not so much in developing the next gas turbine, but in terms of how to put a project together from the beginning to the end, and how to make it meaningful. 
So let me talk now about something which is very close to my heart, which is process changes. Okay. Um, I'm going beyond technical things. This is, things have changed. Things have changed radically from the time I started work. Uh, the global cooperation. Um, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes. Many years ago, I'd like to say 200 years ago, I had the opportunity of getting on the infancy of the CFM program, which is a collaboration between uh, SNACMA France and GE. Uh, I was put in the program as the coordination person because I was speaking French. And I discovered that it took much more than language to bring team together. Uh, and it takes trust, it takes understanding, it takes basically knowledge that people have different agendas and stuck together. And the norm today is that most programs are going to be such that engineers which come out of good schools are going to be put into, I don't think there is too many aerospace programs, commercial and even military, I mean, look at the GSF today, okay, that do not require collaborations with different entities, uh, not only uh, domestic but international. So I think this is very important. Um, uh, let me go on to this. So there's a collaboration, then there's something else that goes with that, okay? Not with that. How to design a part? I mean, we used to design, we have the design engineers used to be in building 700, and he or she could walk out to the building 800 and see the parts made. It doesn't happen anymore. But now, if you take any of the large companies, they'll do, you'll be designing a part in one particular part of the world and you're producing it somewhere else. Why is that? Because there are parts, let me, I'll stick with G because I have more experience with G, okay? I mean, you design a part in beautiful Cincinnati and you analyze it, it does the heat transfer overnight in Bangalore. Why? because G has a center in Bangalore who really does pretty strong analysis and they're better tool to do that. But some of our engineers are in, which are in Cincinnati. Where are we gonna make it? We're gonna make it where it's the most efficient to have it made. So what you're facing today is the fact that your communication between a design activity and a manufacturing activity is totally electronic. Why is it important? It's important because uh, you cannot tweak it. You cannot tweak it at the last minute. You cannot have, for some who are here, who are still very young, we used to have design boards, okay? And you have a design board and then you have the person who knew more about the whole thing, which is the, the draftsman who put the part on the design board, and then the engineer will come over and we'll discuss, you know, how we're going to fit that hole and how we're going to do this and what tolerance we're going to do that and so on. This is gone. This is gone. You really need to be precise enough and knowledgeable enough to be able to produce a part that can be built, that will be built uh, remotely. It takes a discipline and it takes much more analysis before you release the part, which I think is positive, by the way. I'll get to that in a minute. So um, it, it's a very powerful tool, but it's a tool that has to be managed very carefully, okay? While you have a 24-7 collaboration, by now you can almost do the whole thing around the clock. As I said, 
6 o'clock at night, you send a part to Bangalore. By the time you come in at 8 o'clock in the morning, you get the analysis done. And you get your temperature maps, and maybe the program has been developed by Dr. Mavris, but uh, we got it, we've got a tool that works. Um, this is what I was referring to. The old time. You used to design a part, and guess what? You put it on a test, and you found out if it worked or not. You broke it. And if you broke it, you just fixed it, and you tried it again. The system we have today are getting so complex that you cannot afford to do that. Uh, you really need to put the time up front to do a full-blown, deep analysis before you go into the design. And when you release the design, it really should work the first time. And the exceptions, to the time that you have to redesign should be an exception as opposed to a rule. That's how you can, I'm going to get to that in a minute. So it's a different mindset altogether. Sure, I don't want to take the experimentation away from, from engineers. But they need to understand, by the time they get onto a program, they need to have enough tools to be able to design the parts so they work. And that takes much more thinking and much more design analysis than before. So developing the CFDs for people who want to do aerodynamics or air mechanics, whatever, is so important at the beginning because that's going to take them to the next step without having to re-evaluate it. Okay? Uh, I had some curves on a totally different subject. You see the cost of changes as you move downstream. By the time you get out of the design stage are enormous. So that's so important. And I do think the students need to really understand how important this first phase, which I'm going to get into, is to design process. OK, that's the upfront product engineering. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details. This is what we call a toll gate program. We had it at G. I, I talked about this many different places around the world. But many of the corporations have the same thing. And you see here, without going through the, all the details, the different phases. The, f the, the first three, three the triangles at the beginning is really the concept stage, where for us we work with the Airbus or the Boeings or the Embraers or whoever, and understood what they wanted to do. It's an evolving process. By the time you get to toll gate three, which is the first triangle, what you have done in an, by iteration with the customer, you understand what the customer is looking for. And it takes back and forth because, you know, basically you say, okay, I'm going to do a nice engine for you and it's going to go that much thrust and how much fuel consumption and the customer will say, I want something better. And then you get, by then you have toll gate free, you really have your technology pretty much outline of what you want to do. And then you get into the next three triangles where you really do essentially uh, more of the system design. And by the time you go to Tollgate 6, you know you can make the program, you can make your, you, on paper anyhow, you can make your cost, you can make your performance and so on. And this was you put, push the button and you go downstream into putting it together um, and running tests, you see a first engine to test here, and essentially a certification and then a production. Um, I teach this in a, in a particular course I'm going to refer to. It's an understanding that is so important to for the young engineers who, and who say that the woman I design a part, it, has, it needs to be able to survive that process. And toll gates are extremely important to say if I cannot make the product, if, I, if I, I'm not going to release a part that I don't know how to make, unless I have many data to says I know how to be able to close that, all right? Um, I refer to my proverbial fan blade. I said we had a program with fan blades. We didn't know how to make them. 
We didn't know how to test them. We didn't know what it took to inspect them. It was, I came out of air with a big word. I said, no more adventures. It's too painful to do that. And I think in young and easy to understand that. Okay. Whoop. I keep on doing this. So that's, I believe, at my last chart. So what we need to teach young engineers. I think it takes a course, call it whatever you want to call it, to make them understand the difference, how important to understand requirements, um, and how to develop it within their colleagues, how to work in teams. This is what capstones help a lot. Our capstones are always have five or six uh, young students together. How to put a team together. How to put a team together and with, uh, how the team is structured, uh, how does, who does it report to, where did it go to, how it gets empowered and so on. Communication. I don't think we can teach young people enough about communication. If you want to succeed, you need to get everybody on the same page all the time. I mean, I, I mentioned our experience with SNACMA, which has been a real tremendous success. Okay? It really is to learn how to work, work together. And over-communicate if you have to. Lean Six Sigma, it it's, makes sense. I think that should be part of any program how to project plan, how do you resource plan, how do you execute a project, how do you look at finances. And then that last but not least, ethics. Understand how to be clean 100% of the time. You cannot afford not to do it. I can tell you, we certified the G90, and that was a long road. G at the time had a gentleman who ran the company by the name of Jack Welsh. He asked for an audit of the program to make sure that none of the engineers working on this had taken any shortcuts. And you know, when you work in the middle of the night and you have half the data and you say, okay, maybe I don't need to know. You cannot afford not to be 100% clean in what you're doing. So anyhow, this is some very brief outline of what I think one course should be added at the undergraduate undergraduate level, we have it as an elective today. Okay? I think I'm the one who's advocating we should put this as a requirement. Anyhow, one thing we need to leave all this propulsion or pure propulsion here, it's a very exciting world. And we really have a great opportunity for them. And we really want to give them the best chance to succeed. Thank, Thank you. you. When you talk about this uh, virtual world, this 24-7, um, and how multidisciplinary um, this real venture is between, say, design and manufacturing, you really hit the uh, nail on the head when you talk about communication, right? So engineers have solutions, but if they don't communicate those, those solutions, then it's like it didn't exist. Right. Okay. Dr. Um, it's all right with you. I sure. stand up and walk around. Uh, the coffee and the water I drank are hitting me, so I gotta move around a little bit. Uh, I hope uh, you'll find uh, my presentation uh, complimentary to the previous uh, panelists. Thank you very much for uh, all the insight that's been provided. I am uh, from the Air Force uh, Research Laboratory at uh, wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. And um, I, um, I made my presentation a little bit more personal, so I purposely asked our panel uh, chair to keep my bio short so that I could uh, tell you a little bit about my background, uh, what I've done at AFRL in terms of uh, education and uh, reaching out uh, for uh, two universities and the community as well, and then hopefully try to address the questions that were originally asked. So the, uh, the outline is, I'll give you a little bit of background, uh, of my personal background in some, and then uh, try to uh, look at the key questions that were uh, part of the panel here. Um, are we succeeding in preparing? I took the liberty of adding aerospace to propulsion because, you know, to me, uh, aerospace, propulsion, aero, the, it's, it's all linked together and we really can't separate it uh, completely. So I took that perspective. Plus, I'm, I'm an aerospace engineer uh, by training. 
And is uh, education fundamentally missing something? Uh, and then the third one, are we, as we travel down this high-tech path, is, uh, is there something lost in the shuffle? Uh, so my personal background, I came to AFRL in um, part of the, what was called the Palace Night Program in 1992. I moved to Dayton in 93, just in time for one of the worst winters that they had at that time. Growing up in California, you know, it was quite a shock when the temperature dropped to 24 below uh, one February night. And I joined the uh, Structures Division in what was called the uh, Flight Dynamics Laboratory. In uh, 99, I transitioned to the Aeromechanics Division, and I worked with Dr. Joe Sheng, uh, a, a pioneer in the area of computational fluid dynamics at the time until his retirement. I joined what is now called the Multidisciplinary Science and Technology Center with uh, Dr. Dave Morehouse until his retirement. And uh, then I served uh, in the Air Vehicles Director with Dr. Don Paul until his retirement. So I keep telling my supervisors, you know, every time I work with someone, they end up retiring, so, you know, your turn's coming next. So. <laughs> Uh, currently, I am in transition from uh, where I've been. I'll tell you a little bit about that work and, and how it relates to this topic. And um, I, um, I'm taking on a new job, uh, which is actually came at a very timely moment for uh, the discussion involved with this panel. I have three kids, uh, one wife, and no pets. So it gives you some of the, that basic background. So. Um, my, uh, my personal education and background, um, in, uh, I am a professional engineer registered in the state of Ohio, and I did that just because uh, there was an uh, engineer uh, in the uh, work group I came to work in who bragged about how you know, he had a PE, he didn't care about PhDs or anything like that, so I took the test and passed it and, you know, just to make sure that I am a real engineer, okay? So, <laughs> um, I have a PhD uh, at Stanford University in the Aeronautics and Astronautics uh, Department. And uh, I also have a master's from there, uh, from uh, the same department. And it's actually in the course of taking some of those electives that uh, maybe sometimes uh, people shy away from that I also uh, earned enough uh, units to uh, get a degree in the history and philosophy of science. Partly it was driven because uh, it helped me to understand uh, the connection between science and technology and society. And I, I wanted to understand that. It made me aware that uh, what we do as scientists and engineers is a, a human-related uh, activity and endeavor. Uh, I have a BS from the University of California, Berkeley, and actually, again, taking some more electives. Uh, they also gave me a, a dual degree in material science and engineering uh, during the course of my study there. It did cost me some. You know, I lost some summers uh, having to take extra classes and all and uh, trying to fit it in into the four-year degree in there. Uh, and actually, the um, the uh, degree uh, in 92, uh, in the history, I did have to give up some uh, fellowship at that time because, you know, they didn't take too kindly for me having a technical fellowship uh, studying uh, in the humanities, in the Department of Humanities and all. So, uh, so teaching experience, uh, I've been uh, with the University of Dayton since 95, uh, Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department. I've taught uh, one class per semester, in everything from aerodynamics, flight dynamics, hypersonics, and CFD. Uh, mainly uh, graduate students, so uh, you provided uh, uh, Professor Mavris a lot of insight into what goes on in the undergrads, which is significantly different than uh, what we can do at, at the graduate level. Many uh, masters and PhD level committees. Uh, occasionally I've taught also at the Air Force Institute of Technology, AFID, and, and at Wright State University. So uh, what uh, I've been currently involved with is uh, in the Multidisciplinary Science and Technology Center is a process to address the problem that we have in terms of conceptual design of a complex uh, aerospace system. Uh, in, uh, in the traditional design process, I guess I can call this the conceptual design 20th century, uh, we have been able to carry out maybe one or two configurations into a preliminary design partly because of the uh, kinds of tools that have evolved in that, or that evolved in our discipline and are in ingrained and embedded in, in industry practice. Uh, we wanted to uh, really determine um, a better way of coupling the different disciplines now that systems are becoming more tightly integrated. And uh, we also needed uh, to address the issue of uh, what is the impact on the, uh, on, on the technology that is based on physics rather than rules of thumb or, or other uh, knowledge. So uh, we've uh, been developing in the group that I'm uh, then with is uh, a goal of uh, uh, carry on tens of configurations instead of one or two through the design process 
be able to do that at a system level, uh, a system level technology assessment, coupled physics in the simulation, targeted testing, and as the previous panelists mentioned, you know, be, we want to simulate, then um, uh, design, and then uh, uh, go from there. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is the timely generation of analyses for design. Uh, in, in all this process, uh, we, have, uh, we don't do it all in-house. In fact, we have established a collaborative partnership with uh, various institutions where we do bring in students and uh, attempt to provide them with projects that are directly relevant and related to this activity that we have ongoing at, at AFRL. And uh, to some degree, I think we've been uh, successful. Uh, we have a, a collaborative center with uh, Virginia Tech where uh, we propose uh, thesis topics. Uh, we serve on the thesis committees of the students. Uh, they work on this project. And in fact, we've been able to hire right now as contractors, uh, a couple of them once they graduate from uh, Virginia Tech and come and work with us to, uh, directly to continue the work that they started in their master's or PhD work. So uh, the Air for All academic connections are um, longstanding and, and uh, uh, we believe uh, hopefully uh, will enable us to continue to uh, cultivate a, uh, another generation of uh, SNEs uh, for AFRL. From my own personal experience, and I'm not the only one that does this uh, at AFRL, when we teach, we often look for you know, students that are capable. We, you know, we try to recruit them to come into the lab, work with us in the summer. Uh, we work closely with students that go from AFRL to other universities as part of the workforce development. And, that, and uh, we try to align uh, their thesis to their uh, uh, relevant AFRL relevant R&D work that goes on. Uh, we also propose topics in what's called the Dayton Air Graduate Student Initiative, DAGSI, here in, in Ohio. Uh, with AFID, we work to uh, propose uh, thesis topics, again, relevant to the, the research that we're doing, uh, as well as, as of, of interest and aligned with the skill sets of the students. And we have various summer programs where we can bring in students uh, as well uh, as uh, faculty and, and other members of the community. So as far as the uh, key questions are concerned, um, are we succeeding in preparing the next generation of propulsion aerospace engineers? And my short answer is sometimes, so hopefully you know, we can generate some discussion on that. Is education fundamentally missing something? Uh, possibly, you know, again, I left these uh, 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 ambiguous for now as we uh, can get into more discussion. And as we travel down the high-tech path, I think, uh, is there something lost in the shuffle? And the only thing that uh, came to mind in this is that we need to, again, uh, maintain the connection to the human element uh, in order for us to uh, really uh, proceed and not lose sight of that, I think, is uh, going to be very important. Uh, yesterday, I was in a panel discussion here on uh, complex systems engineering. And again, that is also very uh, timely because next week I'll be in uh, San Diego as part of another panel talking about complex uh, systems as well. And I picked up uh, a, a neat uh, uh, reference. This is a quote from John Gall. He calls it uh, systematics. Uh, of course, uh, Wikipedia, the source of all knowledge, right? So online. He lists uh, uh, these. And I think it, it, we can, uh, uh, we can, it's not going to take a hard argument to make the case that the process of education today is, in fact, a complex system. Professor Marvis's chart certainly demonstrated that. And it's, it's quite different than you know, my generation went through and the, the other speakers' generations went through. And, but uh, we need to be mindful of a couple of things. Um, I like these quotes. A complex system cannot be made to work. It either works or it doesn't. <laughs> Simple systems designed from scratch sometimes work. Uh, complex, some complex systems actually work, and you know, I would put an exclamation mark on that to emphasize uh, that point. A complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from simple systems that do work. And uh, finally, a complex system designed from scratch uh, never works and cannot be patched up to make it work. You have to start over beginning with a simple system that works. So as we discuss the, uh, the next generation of um, engineers, aerospace, propulsion engineers, civil engineers, or, or um, SNEs, uh, I think it would be helpful to us to keep these uh, questions, these issues in mind. So um, with that being, uh, my new job is uh, actually to serve as a point of contact for AFRL with university relations. So I hope to continue not just uh, this dialogue here today, but hopefully with other uh, universities and, and the rest of the community to be able to um, 
discuss what is needed for uh, the future workforce. Uh, of course, AFRL is interested in maintaining its uh, competence and, and uh, uh, relevance uh, in, uh, as part of the uh, aerospace community um, as well. Uh, so uh, other thoughts in closing is, um, first, don't break what already works. Sometimes we do uh, have, uh, we are serving the community and we do generate good students. I've seen them, you know, I work with them and, and you know, I'm recruiting them. Uh, all, but we should always seek to improve what already exists. And then finally, relevance is important and in fact is essential. In engineering, of course, is physics and mathematics applied to solve real world problems. It's, uh, it's actually a community partnership effort. I know it may sound cliche you know, to say it takes a village, but uh, indeed it, it does here. It's gonna require a partnership between academia and its primary role, industry, and uh, the government labs, because that's where I reside and I know that it's, it is needed. And finally, engineering is by people and for people, and of course, the planet that we live in. So uh, finally, uh, the... Uh, Small text at the bottom here, this is the disclaimer. The opinions expressed in these slides are purely my own. Do not represent uh, the official position of the US Air Force <laughs> Department of Defense or US government. So I'm not those radio personality guys that can say that really fast, but you can fast forward the tape and listen to it that if you like, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. There's a common theme here um, that there needs to be that cooperation between the universities and the employers, right? That's so we right. heard that from Stig and, and now from you. Know, thank you. Yes. So I'm so glad that Jose uh, and uh, moved a little bit so I don't have to keep my back <laughs> to you guys and you guys at the same time. So um, started, um, I think I'm going to continue this theme on it, but maybe summarize it in a slightly different way on it here. The, the, the take that I get from this is that we are in a business that is about learning still. And if you talk about going to university and getting a degree, you're not done. I mean, this, I, I had the great pleasure of being um, an interim department head for a year in civil engineering. And after sitting and listening to, to how concrete gets done and load factors and all the safety in this, I felt really, really sorry for them. And I was really happy to come back to aerospace engineering because it's exciting. This is something that we do new stuff all the time. When's the last time you saw a new highway bridge? It's mm -hmm. terrible. Um, so I figured I'd start out here with some pretty pictures because we like, I'm a CFD guy, so I have to have a pretty picture somewhere on this. But just talking about um, this idea of culture of learning on it, I think if you're in a university and you're doing things, you have to be people who are not so much the experts for now, you have to be the experts that are learning for later. Okay, you, you, you're learning at the same time. And if I'm not learning still, uh, and if you're not learning still, you're stagnant on this and something is going to pass you by. So hopefully I can work these two together. The questions that I had up here are, are changes, the same questions that we had before. And I'll get back to, to what I think are, are some answers to them. They're not unique. It's a design space that we can, we can come up with multiple ways of looking at things. So the approach, what I'll put out here is I'll do some, some blatant um, advertising for Cincinnati on here a little bit just to, to say something about us. Uh, talk uh, some about aerospace curriculum, our aerospace curriculum. It's probably very similar to most others, but I like to, to have a different spin on some of the things that we do and reasons why we do that. I'll show you one example of a capstone that we had from this past year because I think it, en it encompasses this idea of learning and, and going a little bit further than what other people say. And, I, and uh, Mike sits on our advisory board, Mike Kyle in the back there. Um, he'll remember something presenting this to our advisory board mm -hmm. and some of the comments that people said on there, which were really instructive. I think it was interesting to hear. And I'll talk some about our co-op program because this is the basis of, of what we do. And I think it does help in terms of uh, understanding how to continue learning outside of the classroom and that this becomes an important aspect of what you do. And then finally, that last slide goes to this faculty expertise a bit too. I'll talk some again about that. So my, my advertising slide here. Um, 1906, this guy Herman Schneider started uh, cooperative education in the US. I think this came over from our friends in Britain. Uh, so it's, we've been doing it for a while. We like to say that we're the second aeronautical engineering program in the country started in 29, 1929. It's with help from Orville Wright, from this guy, Bradley Jones, who's a navigator on here. And we had Neil Armstrong as a faculty member for about 10 years. So I think we're unique. You guys will have to tell me if, if we're not, but we can trace our roots 
to the first person to successfully fly and, of course, land, which is the important part, and then <laughs> the first person to step on another celestial body. So for an aerospace program, we have some, at least a link to both of those. And I think we like to tell, the, tell our students that so they know the history of what's going on. We've been collaborating with GE. It's in our back door. Um, we're, we're, I think, 12 miles apart, Mike, something, something like that on it. Uh, the Edison Engineering Program, which is part of what they do currently of sending people to all, o all over, now started in, in the 60s in our program in aerospace with them, and we've been part of their University Strategic Alliance almost from the start on this. We have um, two really different programs on here. Since we're a mandatory co-op school, uh, uh, Professor Mavris will, will probably cringe, we are five years to start, so all of our students come, come and they know that it's gonna be five years. Um, but uh, we can also have a program with about five years with enough advanced placement, students will come in and, um, and do a, a bachelor's and a master's in five years with doing research co -op. So it's possible to do that in this context. We have about 350 undergraduate students and 17 faculty. I think the order is around 100 um, graduate students. I guess we're, we're roughly half the size of Georgia Tech in, in terms of this. Um, we're growing, though, rapidly because that's, that's how uh, these things are happening. Uh, seems like there's a lot of people interested in the field. So I hope this would come out a little bit better. This is our engineering curriculum, and I think these guys have spoken to this in some respects already on it. Foundational courses start things off. You, you need to have some basis in chemistry, calculus, differential equations, English and technical writing, all this kind of good stuff, and, and physics, obviously, in this. But you're going to have to use that and build. So we start on engineering fundamentals, which everybody's kind of familiar with, I guess, the statics, dynamics, thermo, heat transfer, numerical methods. And we introduce some other courses that we call engineering foundations, which are freshman classes to get people started thinking like an engineer. Maybe you're starting to talk about units. You're doing some hands-on things, though, some demos that aren't, you don't really have to know anything. You know, my friends in civil engineering really didn't like it because the students as freshmen designed bridges, right? And so they, obviously, you don't need to know anything to, to go and start designing bridges, right? They can do it as freshmen. But they do it um, in, in that class. And they, um, uh, we also have a course in engineering models to, to try and take some innovative approaches to teaching calculus and programming at the same time and doing things together on this. Once you've completed these sorts of courses, we have what amounts to the standard um, areas that people will work in, a dynamics and controls courses, uh, fluid dynamics, propulsion systems, solid mechanics. And then we introduced, um, I think it was about 15 years ago, before we did our semester conversion, at the same time Ohio State had to do that, we went from quarters to semesters, but we introduced these about 15 years ago um, that, that are what we like to call integrated engineering courses, where you're doing little designs early on in the process. So some of these courses are including uh, probabilistic ideas. We teach some of our statistics there. That's not great. I, I, you heard my first degree is in mathematics. I, I love having a formal math course. Engineers almost always hate having a formal math course because it doesn't really apply to anything un until you realize that it does, I, I guess, on this. So, um, but, but those courses are included in, in these, uh, pro uh, these courses, or these, those ideas are included in these courses. And we're also doing the, the problem solving, group work together, teamwork, all this sort of stuff early on. So this starts, this starts in freshman year and kind of permeates throughout. We have some room for technical electives. And um, you know, this is, this is a, 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 an issue with curricula in general. I mean, you, you are restricted and nobody wants to throw something out. What would you throw out from this list? don't know and we've asked this question many times so we tend to be a little bit more inflated than the person who who has the 120 credit hour liberal arts degree we're maybe a little bit higher I think we're about 128 or something like that but it's still not everything we're not going to get everything in and, and that's that's something that we should kind of embrace I guess on this especially when it comes to the, the, the idea of doing technical electives because we allow our students to take most of our first, second year graduate courses as their seniors. They're at the point where they could anyway uh, in this. So we have courses in combustion, CFD, finite elements, additional programming, non-destructive evaluation, uh, vibrations, acoustics, air acoustics, systems engineering, and research as well that you can do in somebody's lab. And most of our students who are doing, um, doing their um, their um, uh, masters will do a research co-op as well uh, at the end so they can work on their thesis. And then we have three capstones that we end up doing on here, an aircraft design, 
It's really design, build, and fly. It's the SAE competition, and, it's, and it is a competition, so we're, we're active in that. We've done quite well in that in the last couple of years. We have an engine, really, to call it design, we call it engine design. It's really engine modification program. It's, it's your AFRL's APOP program. And um, I'll show an example of this in just a second because I think it's really kind of relevant to the idea of what you can do in those courses and why it matters to be doing these things. But it is not a, a fly, it's a test. It's a modification test program, which I think is really important. And then we do a spacecraft design. Again, we're not launching rockets into space, but we have done cases in the past where they'll launch on a sounding rocket, a payload, that usually takes longer than just one year to be able to do because you have to get onto a rocket at Wallops Island or something like that or CubeSat or something along those lines that NASA's launching. Uh, but we have done competitions where they'll launch a rocket, deploy a rover, and make sure that it can move on the ground, which is, which is the sorts of things that, that I think the students have to do to be able to um, you know, encompass all this and make this all work. Um, on top of this, every one of our students does co-ops from freshman year to their senior year, and they'll do five of them. I'll talk about that in a second, but they're working in industry. And by the way, if you have a job that you'd like to have a student come, or if you're at a university, this is my, my small ad for co-op on here. I have a lot of students who could use co-op jobs. I'd be quite happy to take your card and send them off to people on this. So let me talk uh, real quickly about this engine uh, design on this. The, this APOP challenge was basically to take this JetCat engine and try and extract 500 watts of electrical power on it. It it's, has lots of different solutions, which is great because some of the ones that came out, this is one of the particular groups where they basically wanted to, to siphon off some flow from the nozzle, uh, put a turbine and a gearbox and a generator behind that. And the solution that one group came up with, which I think is instructive to talk about for just a second, is to use some additive manufacturing type of ideas and fabricate something. They did it in plastic first, they sent it out to do it in Inconel for the test on it. But they designed something that looks like this, did analysis on top of it, and then made this work. Which to me, it was the instructive part to this, and I think Mike would probably remember, that when we presented this to our advisory board, we have people from, from um, big companies, you know, the GE roles, we have people from that. We also have people from suppliers that are making stuff. People from the suppliers, I won't say what company, one, folks, one, folk, one uh, person said, don't do this sort of stuff. We, we don't, you know, this is too advanced for you to do. And one person from a, a big company sat and said, no, this is exactly what we want you to do. We want you to dream some. This is a point where you can dream. Dream and try this stuff. See if you can be the ones to take this to the next level. And so these capstone courses, if you let students do it, if you let them try, they can do amazing things. Now, students can also you know, do, do kind of garbage, too, on this here. And you have to be aware of that. But that's why you're there as, in, as faculty to try and lead them uh, past that. So I thought this was, this was kind of a nice and informative um, example of what you could do uh, in, with them. Now, I'll talk uh, briefly again about co-op. It's five of these 15 week, it's really 15 to 17 week, but our semesters are 15, so it makes it easier to explain it. Where they'll start off as freshmen, have one summer off, and that's it for the rest of their life, and then go in class, on co-op, in class, on co-op, alternately until their senior year. So they're getting a year and a half worth of experience in companies, and you could look at that and say, well, it's delayed them a year. They make about $10,000 a, a co-op session. So put those together, you have about $50,000 that you made, maybe that offsets that first year somewhat. But also these folks are coming out with jobs for the most part in companies, which is, which is what we're you know, really ideally trying to do with folks on it. Um, the schedule is arranged so that we can, we can be friendly with a lot of the, the company co-op programs or internship programs which work mostly in the summer on it. But we have most of the students out in the summers. Um, and we placed, I think this year, 200 and 60, 270 students in this, which is, which is big numbers on it, um, for it. As I said, you can do research assignments as part of that, and so if you are a professor and you wanna have one of these students and you wanna have them come to your school, it's an idea. You can talk to Jim Tappel here. Uh, and the last thing is international co-op, and I think um, I have some unique perspective on this that I'll, I'll share. I, I didn't think to put this in the slides, but one of my jobs right now 
is as a co-dean for a uh, joint co-op institute that we have. And then before you think, wow, aerospace, you're doing co-op with, with people in China. No, we're not, we're not doing that. And aerospace is kind of, they chose me as aerospace because it's electricals and mechanicals, and, and I'm not sending any aerospace students there. But the, the, the purpose of this is to have Chinese students taking US courses doing co-op in China, and then they're able to, they're, they're learning in English. They're, they're doing our curriculum, actually learning in English, and they're ready to be able to work globally. We're working this for a couple reasons. Down the road, we want to be able to have our students go and work with these people as well. We already do international co-ops in Germany, in France, and in multiple places, but you go, and I think everyone here will not if I say you're going to work with someone internationally at some point in your career. You're probably going to spend a lot of time working with them. So understanding that, especially for kids, Mike, Mike and I have, have kids here coming in Ohio, and, and, and uh, Nick as well, Ohio students, folks are not really used to world travel coming out of here. And they really want to stay close by, but they have to understand that now you're going to be working with other people. And I think it's really important that we kind of find ways to do that somehow before you get to a point where you know, <laughs> you're, you're smack in the face with um, meeting people who, who uh, have a really different accent and spending two weeks in a place that the food is not, you know, even McDonald's is not the same <laughs> on it. So, um, so what else did I want? I, I wanted to put here just a couple of the companies that we end up working with on this. Um, big names, and again, uh, we'd like to have more. We're always looking for more co-op jobs, especially in our business here. So let me jump then. I spoke briefly about this culture of learning and the idea that if you're not continuing to learn, you're not going to be a good professor on this. And I believe that fully. If you're not studying the latest things, you can't impart that to your students. Even if you're teaching statics, you can go and talk about something that's going on in an engine because you know about it. That, that, that really excites students to go further. So we kind of look at our program in air, at working on aerospace systems as having people who are decision makers. This is how we split up our, our group of faculty. Decision makers, experimentation, testing, diagnostics, and modeling and simulation. And so the people who are decision makers, this is controls people. So if you have controls people in the group, they like to, you know, they like to be in control. They want to be decision makers, I guess. That's where it comes from. But they're working mostly um, UAVs, air traffic control type of issues here. Not so much propulsion heavy at this point. Experimentation and testing, very propulsion heavy on it. Pulse detonation facility, uh, jet facility, combustion, acoustic liner, fire test, erosion facility, these sorts of things. Our NDE people are also heavy into doing um, ultrasonics, um, all sorts of other techniques for, for uh, non-destructive valuation and diagnostics, and we have a big group that are doing different things in um, simulation from, uh, from inlet CFDs, FEA type work, finite um, uh, computational air acoustics, thermal management, all sorts of visualization things. These are people that are doing things related to propulsion, and if you want to have students who care about propulsion, well, you need to have people who are working that. So the programs with roles and GE that are working with industry, seeding the higher level people for graduate students, professors, comes down to being a real payoff you know, for getting students later on that understand something about your problem. I think that's, that's an important point to make. So this is my opinion. I put it a little bigger than Jose put it on here. Uh, on it. Just, uh, um, are these changes needed for the future propulsion? And I kind of answer this flippantly. Of course they are. But they're also not needed in some sense. We can't chase technologies on this, I don't think. I think what we have to be in, in universities is for the required course is fundamental. And then when someone wants to do something else, someone's going to specialize. And I think um, Dimitri mentioned um, master's degree being a first degree in this. Specialize in something afterwards. Be good first at the fundamentals, then be able to take these other courses and begin to specialize. So uh, on, the other, on the one hand, you don't want to reinvent the entire curriculum just to go and do, let's say, additive manufacturing on it. But you need to have some expertise research and courses at the graduate level going on to that. Um, have we forgotten anything important? We will certainly have forgotten something important if people come out with the idea that I'm done, I got my degree, I can work for the rest of my career, because it's not going to happen. They're going to have to have in their mindset that they need to learn going forward. And if you didn't come here to learn, I don't know why you're here. <laughs> but, uh, but so uh, you know, we're, we're going to talk and discuss those sorts of issues. But I think that's, that's fundamental to this. 
For us, our solution on this is co-op providing this extra additional information from industry that's state of the art. And you know, this is good and bad. By the time you're teaching seniors who have been co-op students, either you're a genius because you're teaching exactly the right stuff, or you're just an idiot because they don't ever, your company doesn't ever use this stuff. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic on it. Um, and I think the, the hands-on competitive portion, even though APOP's not competitive, it's competitive. You know, everybody wants to do well and everyone wants to come up with a good design and, and do this sort of thing. I think this is important because you leave it open-ended, let students go and spend, you know, frankly, they're going to spend 60, 70 hours a week working on things when they're motivated and they care about it. Um, and that's the sort of stuff that you'll get really interesting, good, uh, fun things out of in the end. So I guess that's my end and I'm happy to sit back. So. Thank you. Dr. Walkers, I think you highlight uh, very well that need for the, that practical education, that hands-on of going out and doing a co-op and doing a senior capstone project that actually has, has meaning. So I'd like to open it up for uh, discussion. Um, any audience members, please uh, go ahead and take the microphone. Yeah, this is my baby. You have some for me? So. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, my, my question is relates to uh, the exposure that students get to manufacturing technologies. Um, so that's where my question is going. But just okay. why I'm asking that question, I, I joined Old Voice 42 years ago, so I did out of date with manufacturing technology. I did a five year indentured pension. My, my father signed over my care to Rolls Royce. Okay? I did a bachelor's and master's degree during that program. And the first year of that apprenticeship, I spent in a tech school learning how to use all the machine tools that we used to make anything, basically. Um, and then as I went through the, the various departments of, of Rolls Royce, I ended up in the compressor department. And my final year project was to take a turbocharger and design a main diffuser to convert a truck turbocharger, design a main diffuser to make it look like a centrifugal compressor in an aero engine. We made helicopter engines back then. I did all that design work. I went back into the tech school and machined all those components. And for my undergraduate final year project, I demonstrated the rig work. They gave me, Roger, this is Roger Royce, they gave me a test cell to, to run this thing in, and a technician for union tools to you know, make sure I was safe and stuff like that. Uh, demonstrated that the rig worked, and then for my master's degree, I went on and did more validated work on the inner focus portion on the centric compressors. So, drawing a similarity between co op programs today and, and my exposure, which is 40 years back today, today we've got additive manufacturing. Um, I met uh, with involved at the University of Virginia, um, as Lisa explained, um, and I saw their additive manufacturing capability in our class manufacturing center that we had there. And I saw some of the things that the students were doing in additive manufacturing that they didn't know any better. They were designing stuff uh, that they designed like a, a chain link fence that you'd have to, well, it was actually a piece of uh, code um, where you'd have to do links and normally you'd have to weld the links together. Well, they did this with additive manufacturing. They just, they made it because they had sacrificial plastics and dissolved down and stuff like that. And they, they were approaching design in a completely different way than we did 40 years ago. So the question back to the panel is how important do you think it is to give students exposure to you know, traditional and advanced manufacturing techniques? You know, design build by is something that we sponsor to all the and you've mentioned that as well. That's a great end-to-end -end experience. Uh, with traditional manufacturing for making gas turbine components, how important do you think this kind of thing is? Sorry to take so long to ask that question. Thank you. Do you, how do you, how do Go you, ahead. Yeah, I, 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 I think this is where it really starts to get cool, right? I mean, you have all these different plastic part 3D printers that you can start to, to effectively play with and, and be able to try things and do stuff. We, we have um, a great... Uh, design school in Cincinnati. I mean, their, their industrial design is one or two in the country on it. And, and we get to talk with them um, on, on, a, on, a, on, a on a regular basis. We're really trying to start to, to um, uh, 
to, to, to collaborate a little bit more, but they have such a different mindset on how things get done. What they'll, I mean, they'll look at your chair and decide that, that you know, the, the goodness of how it looks and how, how you sit in it and all this, and we kind of look at it and say, yeah, you can make it for how much, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. But I, I think those sorts of collaborations are on the horizon and we really have to start looking at that. And we have to expose our students to different ways of thinking because, you know, additive is, is opposite to the way that things have been done. Uh, and I, I don't know how the rest of the people feel, but that's um, a time. Go ahead, to start talking. <laughs> I don't know, my case. <clears throat> I, I think, the, as I said earlier, the, prox, the collaboration between manufacturing and design is getting to be one, it has to be one entity. We did something about two years ago. Um, the president of Ohio State took a number of us to visit different companies around the state of Ohio. He called it, whatever, the research scholars. I think we had two days of that. And one thing that came out <coughs> uniform from different industries is, yes, you train your students very well into the fundamentals, but they don't know a number of things. And one of them, going back to the manufacturing, they don't know how to tolerance parts. And you should really try to teach that. Because if you don't teach it, we have to teach it afterwards. I just picked this as an example. Uh, so it's important to do that now. Unfortunately, as I said, we have a limited number of hours, number of time, and it's more of an undergraduate than a graduate thing. But this is why I think at least one course should be addressing some key manufacturing items. And what to select in that course should really come from a survey from the industry of what I think is pertinent, but they don't hear, but they don't see. Because let's face it, <coughs> If I go back to General Electric, they set up a program for their first year students, first year entry students, to teach them what they haven't learned before. And if we can do them, we give them really an entry level capability that other people don't have. So okay. I think the answer to your question, manufacturing, I don't know how to differentiate between new and old. I mean, if I wanted to do that, I'd, you can do a PhD on the whole subject. But I do think to teach manufacturing key items on how you how you tolerance a part, how you design a part. You know, I mentioned before design for six sigma. It's not an un it's not like falling off a log. It's a whole discipline that goes with it and it saved us honestly millions of dollars. Dr. Yeah. Mavris. Um I attended a panel discussion the other day, and they were talking about the role of multidisciplinary training, you know, for MEs to cross-train with EEs. So how do we, we remain flexible or, or obtain that flexibility in our curriculum? Yeah, so I'll answer that one, and I'm going to link it to, to David's uh, question. Um, at the undergraduate level, as I said, okay, we, you have electives, but they're a very small number of, and there is not a reward system for doing so by crossing boundaries. There is a reason why every department has a building that looks like a castle. It just misses the moat, right? Because <laughs> they're not to be invaded, okay? But at the graduate level, the situation is a little bit different because the student usually doesn't pay for the tuition, right? It's the advisor that pays for the tuition in most cases. In engineering, unless you pay for them, they probably will not come, okay? So if you build it and they'll come, that doesn't apply necessarily here, uh, especially for the PhD program. So, in this case now, I assume the responsibility for the student and all their expenses. So, I don't get any kickback from any of the tuition, so I have no reason not to send them to take a course wherever that course is offered. And as I said, it, it would be a very naive perception to say that a good university doesn't have those courses. They all exist. If you take a catalog, they're all there, okay? It's just that people don't usually take them. So manufacturing has been there for a very long time, okay? They have a beautiful building, it's an institute, it's supposed to be cross-cutting, but 10 years ago there was very little aerospace component to it. Now if you think of manufacturing, okay, uh, manufacturing in most domains is a commodity, okay? And the United States doesn't even have the leadership in some of those areas. 
a lot of the equipment for automation comes from Germany, big, big companies over there that do that and so forth. But when it comes to the word aerospace, it's now becoming strategic. And this is not something we want to share with everyone else. So Boeing, for instance, took an initiative. And they, uh, in fact, they named Georgia Tech uh, a Center of Excellence about five years ago in what's called 21st century aerospace manufacturing. So they went to the manufacturing department. They say, we're going to do research in manufacturing, only to find out that those guys were not doing aerospace. They were doing manufacturing. And their manufacturing was more for automation and mass production than what we do in aerospace. So then they came to the aerospace department to finally open the lines of communications and, and talk about it. So the bottom line was that with the advancement of composites, you can now you're unable to decouple design and manufacturing. Those two things are kind of coming together. So now you have to start thinking that way, change the way you teach the material. Um, you need to start thinking of how I'm going to manufacture the part as I'm designing it. And I have to have a fair amount of understanding of manufacturing. So that's where all of a sudden you see the mechanical department was offering the manufacturing courses. There were certificates under the manufacturing department, and more and more students started taking it. So for the last 10 years now, almost every project has a manufacturing aspect to it. Now, the additive manufacturing, subtractive manufacturing, and so forth, what has done, coupled with the fact that all of a sudden UAVs are becoming prevalent, the UAVs brought back design to the university. Okay, When the things were big, we couldn't really play with us. We couldn't really design a gas turbine. But if you're talking about fuel cells now and electrical systems, the universities are now getting perked up getting excited. They can build airplanes again, and the additive manufacturing is a very natural thing for them when they're building onesies and twosies. So definitely, most programs right now have seen a resurgence of you know, designing, building things, testing them. I mean, if you look at the design to build to fly that, that Rolls Royce is supporting, we have 90 volunteers at any given point in time. And there are five competitions per year. So the students come in with great excitement, circle the calendar. We're going to be here on that day and here on that day. They have multiple teams so that you don't have 90 people working on the same thing. You have teams that are more manageable and so forth. Thank you. Ms. Take, I'm going to shift a little bit. Um, do you see our graduates meeting the expectations of the employers, our new graduates? I see some really sharp young people come in. Um, in terms of meeting expectations, um, I think this generation, you know, um, I think this generation has slightly different uh, mindset coming in that sometimes um, we have to work through and get them to see that there is value in getting in and understanding the details. There's value in spending time somewhere to get that foundation. Um, there does seem to be a bit of a, of a um, expectation of moving quickly. And sometimes that happens and sometimes it, it doesn't. Sometimes you really need to, to focus on something. Um, but the students we get, I mean, the, the graduates we get, they're very sharp. I mean, we, we do get good quality people who um, I, I just enjoy talking to them, hearing their perspective. Um, it, yeah, every, every, every person could come in with more exposure in some area or whatever. And, and uh, just to talk a little bit about what, one of the things that we do about that is this, is this graduate development program that we have. Um, if you're on that program, we do actually require a focus in different areas that we want the graduates to have an appreciation for a design session, a make session to get to the how do we make it, uh, a validate session to, to say how do you test something or make sure that it's going to do what you, uh, what you want it to do. And we also have a design make session uh, that's a three to four month project where the graduates, about three or four of them in one team, work on a real world problem, limited in scope, but a real world problem to put into practice these teamwork ideals and um, uh, having to deliver something on a schedule and challenging. So it gives them a little microcosm of what real world is really like, where they're the ones in control and they're the ones doing this, this project. And make is a, is a big aspect of that, being able to do something so that you, if you don't put the hands on yourself, 
you control the making of it and or work with suppliers who, who are making it and things like that. So we, we do have that. Um, but in terms of the, the, the ones that come to us, they're very broad. I mean, they come from universities all over. They come from all sorts of different backgrounds, which we like. We like having the diversity. Uh, you want to have a diverse um, population come from, from backgrounds, from different universities, and, and mix it all together and come up with something, uh, something good for it. So uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that um, there are things that could be, could be better uh, to prepare them for us, but in general, they're very sharp, and as long as they're willing to put the time in and understand what we do is complex, then we can, we can take them somewhere. Excellent, thank you. Yes, please. I would say that it's critical thinking and, and communications. Um, a lot of the, um, the students need a little training in that. The, um, not that they're not good people, okay, but they, even the good people need training. Uh, so you have one sentence answers, you have uh, the concept of uh, an eccentric or esoteric uh, versus an, an introvert versus an extrovert engineer where the extrovert looks at, at the other person's shoes rather than their shoes, you know, concepts like that. If you cannot articulate your point, if you cannot explain to someone what it is that, that you're doing, uh, that's why a lot of organizations have a, a public uh, relations problem where they're working on exciting things but they're not selling it to their constituents, to their public, and, and so forth. Now, you cannot just do that because then you're training people who are just, uh, Good presenters, right? They they have to have subs, substance behind them. Okay, so so I would say first you work the critical thinking, the ability to to tackle open-ended problems, think about them, find a way to wrap their arms around it. Then I will follow that with how do you communicate it? Are you good with working in teams? You will not believe. I mean, I'm doing usually 100 interviews per year on students from every university and sometimes internationally, you will not believe how many people say that they don't want to work in teams and they're loners. Wow. Mm. And that's, that's a turn off right there. I mean, they, you're, not, you know, you're not coming. You know. So once they come in, you try to calibrate them. And, and, and to be honest with you, I haven't seen that the product of one university is better than another one. I haven't seen one country being in another one. Fundamentally, they all have a basic skill in, in in let's say some mathematics. Some countries promote mathematics more. So French students tend to be very solid in mathematics, for instance, a lot better than some other places, you know. But they cannot sometimes think of the bigger picture and they're not trained to do that. And a lot of the people from the Asian cultures, they're not, uh, what is this, uh, you know, you can do whatever you want. You tell me what you want me to do, you know. And, and, and you cannot be training people for advanced degrees where you're telling them what to do step by step. You have to give them a vector and say, you know, you go and you know, communicate and we navigate, but, but I'm not going to hold your hand all the way through this process. Yes. I'll be brief. What Dimitri said, uh, especially on communication, is very real, both writing and, and verbal. Uh, I think we're pushing to do that in first year engineering because it's really what's going to take these students for life. I keep on telling students, the moment they get into industry and they look, and your boss's boss looks at you and you have 20 minutes. It might be the only 20 minutes you're going to have in the next year. He or she is going to make an impression on what you do. And it's amazing how difficult it is for some of these people to articulate what they want to do. Hmm. The same thing on writing. Yeah, writing might be even worse because mm -hmm. most people cannot write. You know, it's an it's, it's a right. pandemic. You know. <coughs> when I'm in my classroom, I always you know I have a dry erase marker, and I tell my class that this does not have spell check. So, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Camberos. Um One thing I wanted to point out it was in Professor Orquid's uh, last chart. There is the 
maybe uh, back to the basics uh, is definitely uh, we should not forget that if uh, if we continue to add uh, the complexity to the education process uh, from uh, what uh, Professor Mavris showed, uh, it's going to collapse under its own weight at some point. And uh, we have to remember that physics is physics, and maybe an approach where engineering is 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 we remember that 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 is the case. We can add uh, additive manufacturing, you know, simulation tools. They are changing the way we do design, but ultimately uh, they have to. Uh, we have to remind ourselves that they are physics based, and the the better that they understand those fundamentals, I think, the more. Uh, able and capable they would be of utilizing those tools. Uh, ultimately, engineering design is uh, a, a, uh, the result of a well-trained mind with uh, innovation and, and uh, creativity uh, coupled with the, a, a good understanding, a solid understanding of the physics and mathematics uh, to do that. So uh, I think we have to keep remembering that. Uh, but uh, adding classes or chasing after the newest technology, we should look for that to incorporate it into that process. And I think just uh, keeping that in mind would be very important uh, for the next. Dr. Orquist, do you think we are preparing our faculty um, well? And how would you better train our incoming yeah. faculty? Yeah, and that's, that's a really fundamental good question because when you get your PhD, you certainly don't get anything you don't get training on how to teach. And that's, that's kind of in the education school, and we don't like them because those courses are so easy type of thing. But <laughs> th there, there is a move in education, I think, to, it depends upon the university, to, to send people to do professional development on this, and not just from the short course in additive manufacturing, but in how to teach and how to communicate. And there, there are new ways of doing things that I think you have to really be, cog you have to be aware of, because um, students today are very instant with things. I mean, you, you know, if, if, I, <laughs> if, if, if I'm not answering emails at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, people get mad. On it, and and I get it because I work the kind of the same way with with people too. You know, I want it, when I'm working with my students, I want if if I have something while I'm walking the dog and I'm going to go and text them something, I, I really do want them to to um, uh, you know to um, uh, to respond. Um, and there are it takes a while to appreciate that that's what they're doing, that they're not being annoying. That they're, so, so those sorts of things, the, the different generational things are important to kind of recognize. I mean, it's, it's good to have kids because, you know, I, I can appreciate what my, what my sons are doing what, when they're taking classes and, and the sorts of feedback that comes. That comes. I, I think that there, there's a lot to be said for, for that aspect of it. Can I add something? Sure. I mean, when I, when I started my career many, many years ago, um, I felt the same way as you're describing it, that you're a good researcher, but you really don't know how to teach. And here you are in front of a group, and I don't think that the university perceived it as something they had to do. It was not much to go ask for help. Today, they have definitely programs. They, they, they try to train people more. And the clientele has changed. Right now, if you get in front of an audience and you say something, they're Googling right there on the spot. <laughs> and Wikipedia is telling them something different than what the instructor is saying. So you know, you got to be very sure about what you're saying. And you got to be well prepared to get in front of an audience and present. Okay? Mm -hmm. In fact, there are people, and I had this argument over a barbecue one time, and I didn't want to get into an argument, that people believe, there's belief now out there, that why should I go to the university and high school? why should I study when I can find everything on Google? Mm -hmm. I can Google things and, and most of the education is memorization and all the information is in front of me. So, you know, you just walk away and you go have a <laughs> You don't want to get in that argument because it's so... Um... Yeah, I'd like to make one comment. Something you, you said just uh, struck this in my mind. Um, one of the things that I like about this next generation is they challenge us. They come in with different expectations. They say, how come I can't do this? How come I can't go search for the internet for this type of thing? Well, because we have business security and this and the other thing. So they challenge us. Um, and, and that's one thing that I find very refreshing, that they come in they say, well, I'm used to doing this stuff in college and university. How come I can't apply that same approach to, uh, to, to, to this? Because 
you, you know, as a company, I think you'd benefit from that. And sometimes they're right, and sometimes we have to let our procedures and our company philosophies and procedures catch up. So I, I do find that the freshness that they approach some of these yeah. things, bringing it to us, is a good mm -hmm. thing. I think their presentation skills in terms of making presentations are also a cut above from our skill set. They can make beautiful presentations very quickly, while ours are, tend to be a little bit more uh, old-fashioned and so forth. Not yours, not yours, Dimitri. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I have help. One thing, you, you question, are a faculty okay? I think in the U.S. they're not. Um, I do think they're very isolated, they're very self-centered. Uh, people try to change that. Uh, the National Academy put something out a few years ago by now, which is the engineer of 2020, it's a publication. Uh, one of the recommendations was indeed that before you became a full professor, you went one year into industry. I had the pleasure or displeasure to give a summary of the National Academy students to the Dean of the Big Ten, which you know are pretty important around Ohio, they were 14, but uh, around this part of the world. And I almost got booted out of the room. Uh, there is a lack of acceptance on many faculty on what the outside world is. I had faculty mentioning to executive meetings we don't need to go to industry. We know, we need we know what they know they need. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's and to me this is a real. It doesn't exist. Yeah. It exists here. It exists in some parts of Europe. It's but it's. I think we're behind everybody on this. Yeah, this is a very partisan group over here. So, for instance, when the group said, you know, we don't want to violate the fundamentals. Believe me, there are people who will never allow you to touch the curriculum in a given department. They are the custodians, the keepers, the sentries, you know. Mm -hmm. So every new that, that you're trying to do is perceived as, a, I don't know, an anomaly or a, yeah. you have to fight to, to get anything to be changed. Yeah. Dr. Camberos, um, do you... Park. Rick, what yes, one please. Yes, please. Yeah, Rick Parker will make up a short observation and then two short questions to panel. First observation was that Dimitri and Mike shattered one of my lifelong illusions about the uh, American university system. <laughs> got, I, I'd always held it up as great that people can do electives outside their own department, they get this bread, they get you know breadth as well as death out of the system. And I challenge our own UK university because we don't do that. I, I think if as a result of policy on hours, financial policy inside the university, sheer negligence, you, you somehow stop that happening, then you need to fight hard to put it back because I think it's very lost. Mm -hmm. The second observation that Mike and, and Paul both said it, was about focus on the basics. Don't, you know, in this pressure to put more and more in there, don't lose the basics. And I, I went to a fascinating lecture by a guy called Mike Bate, another aeronautical engineer, who's actually an architect, a structural engineer. And he designed the Bergal Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. And six of his slides were pages of beautiful hand calculations. And he said, I will not let any of my team turn the computer on until they've done the job once by hand. <laughs> they've done it by hand, then they can turn the computer on, then they can refine it, yet they'll get them up to hand. And I think today we let the kids turn the computer on too early. Mm -hmm. They become expert at producing beautiful pictures out of CAD software, out of CFD, out of finite elements. The little probing, they don't really understand what that picture is on. I think we, we've got to get back to basics. So, two questions, if I may. Uh, one is, given what you said about this pressure to shove more knowledge in there and not use the basics, our university degree course is too short. Should we add another year? Should we look more like the, the Germans? Of the general courses already over five years. Uh, second point is, is one of the reasons this is bunching up at the front end because of dumbing down in the high school, right? Are you guys having to do much, too much remedial work because we're not getting the quality of physics and the quality of maths in the high school, so that has to now be taught in the first year of university. I appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll start with the high school part. Um, 
since I wasn't educated in the United States for my high school, I didn't quite understand the system until my daughters went through, only to realize that there is a two or a three tier system at high school. You can get the same degree or the same diploma, but you have taken totally different courses. So the advanced placement courses are preparing you very well for college. The middle of the road ones, not so much. So, you know, with my first daughter, I guess I didn't know what I was doing, so I let her take whatever. The second daughter, we were a lot smarter. <laughs> kind of <laughs> directed her through the process a little bit better. Um, I haven't seen necessarily that the students are lacking. Um, uh, I mean, progressively the bar is raised more and more, so we, we tend to see the elite, if you like, the, the best uh, in class. So maybe other places have seen something different. Um, the, usually when, when people are coming in, we, we make it very clear that it's going to be a tough road. When I took my daughter to other universities, I was very surprised that the emphasis was on what a great social experience this will be <laughs> and how they're going to grow. They took us to the gym to see people lifting weights and running and aerobics and swimming. And, 10 o'clock and everybody was running, so I, I never saw that at Georgia Tech, to be honest with you. <laughs> and, and I don't think that my daughter would be happy at Georgia Tech after that. Uh, so again, it, there is a big variation. There are a lot of schools right there. I mean, hundreds of schools in, in the United States. So, so you have different bundles, and the schools represented here are probably in, in, the, in the top layer uh, of schools. In terms of um, the number of uh, courses and number of hours, uh, in our case, we're the only university system in, in the United States that if you are a resident of Georgia, you go to school for free. So as such, the state pays for every student that gets accepted. So they have absolutely no desire to see the number of hours increase by one. They want you in and out because they made that promise, and the promise was made to sell the lottery in Georgia. They knew they were gonna make a lot of money, and the only way they can pass that through is by saying that money will go back to educate your kids if they go to college. So you have forces from all sides, but they are electives, okay? Don't take me wrong, they are electives, and they are certificates, and we're encouraging people. But the four years now, with more and more knowledge being shoved in there, is not enough to contain it. Mm -hmm. So I think the master's level is what bachelor's used to be maybe 20 years ago. So I think master, for people who are serious about their career, I think they need to be getting a master's degree. The, the, the four year is real. The four year is real. I've been from, you know, I'm, I was a neophyte into the system. It became apparent, well, unfortunately the state of Ohio doesn't pay for the students. But their parents do, or they have to themselves fund themselves to school. And adding another year is a tremendous burden. So unfortunately, it's not the answer. The answer is probably what Dimitri said, the master level. And I always think there's a big difference. There is the bachelor, there's the master, and there's the PhD. And I try to tell all the students, you probably need to get a master's. If you want to have a PhD, you you want to go into research or something, okay? But the mass is essential. Now, a good part of the thing is most large corporation will hire you at the bachelor level and will enable you to get a master's degree, mm -hmm. you know, through special programs with a corporation where we do half time here and half time there, which I think is very positive because uh, in the time involved, they learn a lot. They turn a lot in place and, and uh, the master's degree. As I said, I think it's going to be very difficult to pass five years because of the fact that the students can afford, and then all of a sudden you become non-competitive. Now, the, the co-op level works, and it's offered in a number of different places, and honestly, Paul can say more about it than I can, but on the other hand, it takes five years. And, and normally that helps students come, come through, you know, they basically work. They work to put themselves to university. So that's an option which is very viable. Okay. Uh, relative to the quality of students coming in, uh, I see, just from my short experience, 10 years, we've been raising the level 
of ent the, the entrance requirement more and more, which I think helps. And a school like Ohio State has a number of peripheral colleges, which are two-year schools. So if you don't have the right uh, grade level to get into Ohio State, you go to one of those peripheral schools, and then you can work yourself into back into, into the university. So that kind of helps even things up. Dr. Camberos, uh, stemming off that, that first question, do you think that we are relying too much on the latest and greatest software, you know, teaching those kind of tools instead of the fundamentals and the theories that go actually in, in behind those. Maybe fans. for the undergrad level, we may be. Uh, I think it's it's fine, you know, like at the masters and PhD, we we have um, student programs where you know we we actually even bring in uh, high school summer students and all, and uh, already they're being introduced to some high level tools that sometimes may not be uh, the best option for them at their level of maturity and understanding of the, of the fundamentals. And uh, so it's okay, I think, it, but you have to be careful with how those are introduced into the curriculum you know, for the bachelors. I think at a master's level, they start to specialize more. They're certainly more mature and um, are probably better able to take advantage of the, of the uh, simulation and computational tools that are being introduced at that time. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what you said about um, cost of education certainly resonates. And do you think if we adjust um, or if we address the cost of education, it's very different in other countries, the cost that students have to pay to get their degrees, that if we change the way that system works and we were able to lower the cost, that we could now make more meaningful degrees? Um, I look at doctors and lawyers, and they know going in that the commitment is going to be much longer than their colleagues in engineering. But you know, we talk about the complexity of work and how we need that education if they're going to be competitive and if they're going to make meaningful contributions. So I guess I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on addressing the, the cost of education versus the amount of knowledge that is now required to create meaningful degrees and we can somehow bring those two together well, the cost of education has been going up by a lot. And I see that with my daughter who is in another state rather than staying in Georgia and saving money. <laughs> but more importantly, you know, I support quite a few students and every time there's a tuition hike and, um, and there are multiple taxes that go with it, um, I get hit with three or four hundred thousand dollars per year in payroll, which means you have to go raise that kind of money to pay for this, for this um, increase. So it is a very real thing. Now, there are some myths uh, going to Rick's, uh, since I'm busting myths over here. Um, the tuition that people provide to university is very, very small percentage of what it takes to run the university. So let's take Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech is state supported, which means you cannot go do whatever they want. But in reality, they're state assisted. So they get only 17% of their budget from the state. Then tuition comes in and puts in another 15% or so. Endowment puts another 6, 7, 10%, maybe 20%, depending on what school you are. And then the remainder comes from subs subsidies from research, the overhead generated to pay the bills for the infrastructure. So a lot of people saying, why is my tuition going up and up and up? It's just part of an overall formula. Their expenses are rising. They're trying to attract people who make big salaries on top of that, right? There is this expansion, constant expansion. If you go to most universities right now around the United States, you'll be amazed by the expansion that is going on, the new buildings that are coming up, and so forth. So, and of course, you know, they cannot return money back, so they live, you know, like they gotta balance the budget. So they, they come up with these deficits. Overheads are going up. I mean, I heard last year, and I fought it very hard, that they wanted to charge the industry 65% overhead. You know, at, at what point it's becoming now not worth doing the research anymore? When 65% of the money is taken off the top, none of that will be returned back to the researcher. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, yes. This point I have, I have a, maybe a different, uh, different piece to this. It is 
people are statistical in, in a sense that some people, if they got the money to, to pay for their tuition, would go off and do great things because they don't have to worry about it. But there's, a, there's another group of people who really work much harder because they have to pay for it. I mean, I, I have, a, you know, we have a mix of students, well, particularly like if you have veterans that come in. You have, uh, have someone who's, who spent, um, you know, a little bit of time in Iraq and Afghanistan. Boy, they really dive into doing work because they're getting assistance and, and they, they, you know, they realize that it's a lot better to sit in their classroom than to sit and have someone shoot them. I mean, that's, that's, that's how it is for them. But there's also a group of kids who come in very young and, um, you know, elite's a bad word, I guess, to throw around, but they're, they're, they're in some ways maybe young and, and spoiled, maybe, is, is the way to look at it, and we'll sit and say, I don't really have to work that hard. It's not real money to me. You know, so, so it, it's kind of hard to figure out if, if it would make complete sense to, to pay for everything, and I think if you did that, you'd probably have to be really selective uh, on it. Um, it, it. It's a lot tougher problem, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to, to, to say. But there is also this fear of the next bubble, which is all these student loans that people will not get jobs, they will not be able to pay them mm -hmm. back. In engineering, most people will get jobs, but there are a lot of other degrees that you will not recover the investment that you made. And that's what they're afraid of, the next bubble when people start defaulting all the student loans. And that is of the same magnitude as the housing uh, crisis. So is, um, in a basic economic model, supply and demand uh, balance out, right? So you increase demand and costs go up. Is, is, is that what's driving the uh, cost of education? Uh, you know, maybe one thing is uh, if, too many people are being pushed to get a college degree and we are not uh, appreciating the value of uh, the uh, vocational schools or the technical schools that also contribute to the industry in, in a very substantial yeah. way. And you know, I don't know if maybe the cost of that is because we have turned education yeah. as a um, more like a customer relation and treat it as a business rather than as what it used to be which is uh, educating uh, at, at different levels, you know, different tiers. It's, it's, it's much, I believe it's much more complicated. Yeah. Because, and, and we can spend all day here, and mm -hmm. we don't have the time. <laughs> but basically, I mean, you know, all the tuition is the same, whatever college you go to. Mm -hmm. And the costs are very different whether you go in arts and sciences yeah. and learn how to write, right. and if you have to run, run experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are athletic departments that take a lot of money. Mm -hmm. there, are, there were articles very much in the news about a month ago on what university presidents make. And, and it's in the millions. Right. It's in the millions. Yeah. Now, uh, our tuition is, our, our contribution from the states are not very high. We're about 10%. Okay. Anyhow, I, I, I think it's much more, the, the reason to keep it for four years it's more than just the money is one good part of it. It's the competition, you know. Yeah. Everybody wants to go into the workplace, okay? And and staying an extra year is a big commitment, right? Right. And uh, and there's another thing. <laughs> different universities, United States. You graduate from different universities, and whether you come out from a good or a bad university. Depending on your ability, you'll be able to catch up. Mm -hmm. In Europe, it's very much you go to a. I mean, in France, to take an example, you normally go five years. You, know, you take two years of prep in mathematics, special mathematics, superior mm -hmm. mathematics, and then you have three years. Uh, the structure is very different. Yeah. Yes, question from the audience. Maybe you've already addressed this, um, but I was uh, after the comparison of engineering to uh, medical school school is the time now, but the engineering school, where you don't get out of high school and start majoring in engineering, you major in something else, and you go to engineering school after you bachelor's degree in something else. Uh, I have young people in my family, I feel like there's so much pressure on young people to make the right decision what engineering you go into, and they, it's never what they think it's going to be, and despite your, your noble efforts to, to educate them or inform them of what they're getting into. But, uh, I, I just feel like there's a lot of pressure on young people now to, 
to, to make the right decision to go in as an electrical engineer, and they've got to base that decision on yeah. you know, you the incomplete information that just need to be exposed to a lot of things before they can make, yeah. make the decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. Um, in my experience, the majority of the people coming in really don't know what we do. Uh, but they know airplanes, right? They know spacecraft and astronauts and things like that, and they hang on to those things. That's why it's a little easier to sell aerospace compared to some of the other departments, because it's even more vague as to what exactly they're doing. And there is a lot of pressure on them making decisions without really knowing. And then. As they get through the process, they realize that that's not what they wanted to do. That's why you start seeing people bailing out. Now, I read a lot of applications, as I told you, for grad school, and the situation is the same there, too. They want to work on things that are so esoteric that I don't know if there are three people in the world that care about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're trying to convince them that you say that, but you mean that. And, you know, and, and it's very difficult to take somebody's dreams and kind of <laughs> reshape them and so forth, right? But that's actually what happens in a lot of those situations. I don't know of many people who truly know what they're getting themselves into. They have convinced themselves, someone told them, and I think it's very important to show them from the very beginning what it is that you will be doing and then make sure that that's what they want to do. I'd like to wrap up the session with uh, a question. Um, if you were given a blank check, you know, what critical shortfall would you address? Blank check. I'm sorry, what was the question? If you were given a blank check. I like the blank check. Yes. <laughs> All right, what would you do with it? What would I do with it? Yes. I can't take it home. Right. No. <laughs> Open for everyone. Dimitri can spend anything. Go ahead. I could. I, I could. <laughs> Do I, start? I, I know what, I mean, for it's our situation. I would definitely put it into scholarships at the low end on it. And even though we're going to lose people, that's okay. I'd like, to, I'd like to have people not have to worry initially about money. Once they're in our system, they're making a little bit of money for co-op wise. I, I would, I, that's, where, that's where I put it. So. I would do something similar to in the sense that unless you pay for them, they won't come to grad school. Mm -hmm. And some university, not to be named, changed their tactics last year. So they got a big donation, an endowment. So now they're offering the best students that they don't have to work, that you will have a fellowship, a true fellowship, and you can work on whatever you want while you're doing your PhD. And of course, you know, the top talent here is that, the placement of that school, boom, they're there, you know. We can't compete by telling them, you come here and you're going to be working on a project. And, there will be deliverables and so forth. So not that we don't want to do that, but I think it would be nice when you have some talent that you want to pull to have that opportunity to, to lure them and compete at the same level. I think uh, you, if this were to happen, you really have two major choices, two major possibilities, as I say. Do you put it in education through these scholarships, or do you put it in research? And I'm not sure the answer is. It's, it depends what the standing of the university is. Because research is just not, it's really, research can be bringing the right faculty to fill the gaps and elevate the status of the school. Yeah. It's a very good question. And it has to be weighed very carefully. Yeah, Mike is making a very good point. Mm -hmm. We're always in this make or buy situation. And if you had the resources, you go out and recruit someone who's a designated hitter that comes in, that has a program, so instead of taking 10 years to develop it, you pretty much set it up within uh, the next semester. Mm -hmm. Good question. Actually, I do have one more parting thought, and that is that this new generation of people are not like the old generation that they will come work for you for 40 years. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they have it in their blood, and they have been told that if they don't jump, they're not going to get promotions and raises. So I heard horror stories from companies that the people jump every one and a half years. Mm -hmm. Now, I haven't seen one and a half years. I have seen three and a half years and five. But if that is the new trend, now we've got a problem. Because we have been notoriously not good in documenting what we do. And we will go to people and say, you know, why document it? He will be here tomorrow and 10 years and 20 years down the road and I'll go visit him. 
So if these people are truly leaving now, we've got to change our strategy that every time we do a project of any type, we need to be documenting, doing the knowledge capture, and on and on and on, so that we don't have all our skills erode every time someone leaves. You know, I think a lot of our IP is in our people, so that's why in many cases, and I do negotiate a lot of contracts with, with companies, and we spend a lot of time on the legalese, but in the end, hiring the people who worked on the project is by far the best IP protection and transfer. So once they come in, they have to be retained. A lot of students come back and they did not like their co-op assignments. In fact, they swear never to go back to the place they went to. So, I mean, we're doing all the right things, but sometimes the system is broken too. So everybody who touches them through their development needs to be serious about the investments that they're being made and wanting to pull these people into the program. The core program, and I don't know if you know this, but in most places, the core program and the professors are not really talking to each other. So they go out to get these opportunities. I very rarely know who went where at the undergraduate level, if they were happy with them or not happy with them, what were they working on. And in many cases, the employer is unhappy that they didn't get to finish what they wanted, and if they had a mechanism to get it done while they're back in school, they would be willing to pay for that. I haven't seen that link made, you know, and such a low-hanging fruit to have a, a continuum over there that, you know, that you pick them up, they come in, they come back to the university, there's a proprietary agreement that protects them, you know, for what they're working on, and in the end, they are continuously supporting the project and the company, and not just uh, one semester every year. Well, I thank uh, each and one of you for your time, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, with the blank check that you mentioned, yeah. I mean, this may be a little naive, but I got the idea of talking to my eight-year-old who's a little entrepreneur himself. Uh, we'd open up an academy, so uh, based on Legos. So yes. he loves to play with Legos. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I can't solve the, the problems. I don't know if it's going to take that bubble to burst to finally get academia, industry, and everything to work together to solve that. But at least we could make a difference in some kids' lives. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.